2022. I'm Planning Commissioner Walter Clark and co-chair of the task force, along with Tim, uh, Planning Commissioner Tim Sargent, who's also co-chair of this task force. I hope everyone enjoyed their Father's Day and happy summer to everyone. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedure authorized by FOIA and the emergency ordinance of the Mount Vernon District SSPA task force needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It is a bit cumbersome, so I ask you in advance for your patience. First, because each member of the task force is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of the members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at appropriate volume for all of the other members. Accordingly, I am going to conduct a roll call and ask that each task force member participating in the meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues. Following the roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member. Tim Sargent. Uh, participating from my home in the Mount Vernon District. Catherine Ward. Participating from my home on Gladstone Place. Gretchen Waltz. Tracy Wood. Queenie Cox. Participating from my home in Gum Springs. Mary Payton. Yes, yeah, participating from my home in Bucknell Manor, Mount Vernon. Holly Jordy, she joined us yet? Hi, Walter. I'm at home in Fairfax County. Hello, Holly. Amid Manir. Hillary Clawson. I'm at my home on Mason Nick. David Levine. Uh, this is David Levine calling from my home in Alexandria. Ellen Young. This is Ellen Young calling in from my home in Bellevue. And Walter Clark, I'm participating from my home in Alexandria, Virginia, Fairfax County. At this point, I will pass a virtual gavel to the co-chairman so that I may be heard to make the requisite motion. I move that each member's voice may be adequately heard by each other member of the Mount Vernon District SSPA task force. I so move. Do I hear a second? I'll second, this is Ellen. Thanks, Ellen. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any aye. Opposite? Anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Second, having established that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that compels these emergency procedures. The fact that we are meeting electronically, that this type of electronic communication is being used and how we have arranged for the public to access this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for the task force to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meetings and that as such, FOIA's usual procedures, which require the physical assembly of the task force and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that the task force may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated video and conferencing line and that the public may access this meeting by registering through the meeting link on the track a plan amendment page of SSPA website at www.fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash planning dash development slash backslash plan dash amendments backslash SSPA backslash south backslash track dash plan dash amendment or by calling 1-844-621-3956-TTY-711 and entering the access code. 
It is so moved. Do I hear a second? Second. OK, who seconded? Mary. Mary, thank you, Mary. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So, Tim, this is Holly Doherty. I'm going to have to abstain on that because I, you know, I know this is the only way we can vote or meet, but I think it's safe for us to meet now. Has it, did the General Assembly pass legislation that allows these type of teleconference for public meetings? That I do not know. Yeah, Holly, thank, thanks for the comment. We actually are going to be getting um, a, a briefing on some um, changes that would take effect, I believe, in September uh, regarding kind of our ability to meet in person. Um, but uh, for now, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're good. We're, we're able to meet uh, in person given the, the current statute. So, uh, excuse me, we're able to meet electronically uh, given the, the current statute. So, um, yeah, I we're... <laughs> You know, I I think it's it. I like these electronic meetings. I think they're very convenient. I just don't think we're in a state of emergency anymore. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll register the abstention. Um, is are there any uh, votes? No. Hearing none. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you. Finally, it is next required that all of the matters addressed in today's agenda must address the emergency itself are necessary for continuity in Fairfax County government and or are statutorily required or necessary to continue <coughs> operations and the discharge of the Mount Vernon District SSPA task forces, lawful purposes, duties and responsibilities. It is so moved. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there all in favor of the motion? Say aye. 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 Any aye. abstentions? Any abstentions? Uh, any uh, anyone opposed? Yeah, this is Holly. I'll abstain again on that. Okay. Uh, any opposition? OK, and the motion passes. All right, thank you very much, Commissioner Sargent. Um, and I will ask staff and uh, Graham. Um, this is a open public meeting, obviously. Have there been any electronic or emails uh, that have come to you all that needs to be addressed by the committee at this time? By the task force at this time? Yes, yeah, we, we received a couple this afternoon, and so I think we can plan to, to discuss those. We can OK, we'll discuss those when we get to that point. Um, so I will turn over to you now, Graham, to um, bring us up to speed on any other house housekeeping matters that we need to address. Okay. Uh, no housekeeping um, other than the review of the of the revised uh, straw man. So if you'd like, we can just kind of get get right to that. But this was the I think the, the main item for tonight. Uh, okay. but I can give, give a kind of at the end, I can give you a um, Based on how the discussion goes, give you a sense of you know, where where things where things should go um, for the for the final final task force meeting. Um, okay, fantastic. Let me pull up the presentation. Okay, so hopefully this doesn't start skipping ahead. All right, uh, but good evening, everybody. Hope you're all doing well, and thank you all for for joining. So a couple of things right kind of right off the bat. Um, I think most of y'all were on the call two weeks ago when we introduced the initial version of the straw man. Um, I thought that was a really good discussion. Um, I think it was really we kind of hit hit on all the kind of the main main points that we've really been kind of uh, working on over the past uh, over the past year uh, regarding the hundreds of metro station plan and other. And so um, this is um, as as kind of straw man for those of you that have. Uh, that have gone through kind of a, a process of you know, looking at draft plan text in the past. Um, this is kind of the, the, the second iteration. Uh, I don't think that it'll be the, the final iteration though. Uh, and so one of the things that we do with this is we like to try to track what has changed since the last time that we that we met. And so what I had sent out on Friday uh, contains that. So what you'll notice in the plan text uh, that, that you received was that there are certain sections that were um, deleted either with a strikeout um, or with the, in the case of maps, um, there were big big X over top of them, and those are areas where we've where we changed something relative to 
the version that you saw two weeks ago. Uh, but those are those ed edits are captured in red of uh, things that were changed that were um, that were added or in strikeout. So just for for organizational purposes, that's kind of how we um, how we go about you know, describing and showing the revisions. Um, so our goals for tonight are to review the again once again re review the revised draft plan text um, as a whole, um, and then consider the changes as a whole as well as the specific details within each section. Um, and then we'll we'll have a discussion on that. Um, and what we'll plan to do is uh, synthesize the comments that we received uh, during the meeting, um, as well as following the meeting, um, and into, put that into kind of a quote unquote final version uh, of the of the draft plan text. And we'll redistribute that uh, prior to the next task force meeting. Um, for you, those of you that were at the meeting um, two weeks ago, um, there was a discussion about adding one additional task force meeting. Uh, to uh, just to ensure that we have sufficient time to you know, go over the text uh, in detail. And so we, what we had had done is tentatively scheduled a final task force vote for Monday, so not a Tuesday, but a Monday, uh, July the 11th. Uh, and so that would be in about two weeks time uh, to provide, or excuse me, two and a half weeks time really, um, in order to uh, give time for that final uh, task force uh, document uh, to come out uh, and recommendation to be uh, produced. Um, so for uh, for for now, I think that there are some additional edits that we will 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 go through and that we'll want to discuss. Um, but that that's our goal is to uh, to keep with that um, July the 11th meeting. Um, so I'll go through the the text and go through the changes. And if at any point you want to discuss anything in particular, just raise your hand. I'm happy to to call on people that way. Uh, I think this seemed to work really well last time, so we can keep up with that um, that kind of uh, way of going about doing this. Um, so y'all are familiar with the site, so I'm not going to spend a lot, of detail, a lot of detail on this, but again, dealing with the Huntington Metro Station and its uh, location within the TDA and the transit station area uh, in the northeast portion of the Mount Vernon uh, Planning District. Um, this was something that we looked at previously. It just kind of describes what the adopted plan text and what the draft plan text say in a nutshell, so kind of the highest of high level points. Nothing has changed between the previous version and this version, so this remains the same. I have it here for reference, um, but we, we don't need to. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not planning to go over it in detail again uh, since y'all are familiar with it. If you have any questions about about this, we can come back to it. So the main high level revisions that we've made uh, to this uh, to this document to the straw man um, incorporated the, the edits and kind of the, the conversation that we had on June the seventh. Um, as well as uh, we had a one one meeting with Lamada to go over uh, the draft uh, straw man plan text as well, where we discussed things uh, with uh, with their team. Uh, and so the revisions that you see are uh, staff's response to those uh, to the comments that we received. Uh, but as you as you I think you'll you'll see it's not going to be everything. And so what we want to make sure is that there's time to discuss um, the things where we have um, something you know, where, where there's either pieces that we, where we disagree um, or we have a different opinion. Um, or where there's things that we want to add uh, or delete now that we've now we're all back in the same virtual space. Um, high level, kind of the biggest thing that you'll notice uh, from the June 7th version is that we've included a series of four uh, transit development area maps. So these are new maps for the whole of the TDA, so that's area that includes the Wamata property, as well as the areas that are immediately kind of influenced by the Wamata property and the, and the Metro station. And those are the TOD areas kind of immediately surrounding the station. Uh, within a five to seven minute walk shed. Um, and so those those four new maps uh, focus on the transit development area recommendations uh, and the WMATA, the WMATA properties recommendations in particular uh, for land use, pedestrian circulation, open space and landscape buffers, as well as building heights. So we can talk about each one of those and then we can I can show it show it to you with with the map, you know, the adopted map versus the proposed map. Uh, and then we can also look at them in uh, in the context of the text, so hopefully between those two two ways of depicting this, you'll be able to kind of see where we're where we've where we've taken this in terms of the map edits. Um, we've also included within the red kind of high level policy elements, um, additional language or clarification or changes regarding um, ground floor uses, multimodal circulation, and tree preservation. Those are kind of the three areas where we've had kind of a, a change in terms of the exact policy. Um, but in, in general, you know, the, the policy direction largely remains uh, the same, but we can talk about these specific details. Um, and then there have been editorial changes throughout. A um, couple of them that uh, where we've relocated um, the Aventon, for example, which is the, the new building that's under construction right now adjacent to Metro uh, to land unit F. 
We've had um, terminology changes throughout to make sure that they're consistent with the maps that we've created. Uh, we've consolidated uh, two sections that deal with related topics, uh, green building and the environment sections of those kinds of areas where those are used. All right, so the first, first map is the recommended land use plan map. And so again, this is the whole of the TDA, uh, the area that we've been really looking at in particular. Uh, can, see, can you all see my cursor if I if I move it? Just want to make sure. Yeah. You're, okay, great. Uh, yeah. So the area of the Wamata property is this area that's currently shown in blue. Um, so, and for, for organizational purposes, the, the next series of maps, everything that's on the left-hand side of the screen is the adopted plan map. So that's what's in the comp plan today. Everything that's on the right, is the proposed. Um, so this will be the, the draft plan text is shown on the right. And so our property, the, the Wilmata property, is land unit E. It's located within land unit E, and it's the area that's shown in blue. Um, and then in addition to the Wilmata property proper, there's also this remnant parcel, which is small teardrop shaped parcel in purple. Um, so the, the main change here, as you can see, is that instead of showing public facilities only and office use only, as the, the main recommendations for the land use plan. Uh, instead, what's now shown is um, this uh, mixed use recommendation. Uh, and so that is consistent with the kind of overarching land use category that we have for um, some other sites that you're familiar with, Huntington Club, uh, for example, which has a mix of uses, uh, as well as the Parker uh, 2550 um, Huntington Avenue in land unit G. So that just des describes that a mix of uses is, um, is um, recommended for this area. And I think that that rec, you know, that reflects you know, the way that the uh, the option is written uh, for the for the property uh, on the site today. A couple of other things that are relatively minor in terms of um, in terms of changes. You'll notice that um, land unit E currently uh, ends directly here along this line right here, and includes a portion of the courts at Huntington and a portion of uh, Mount, Mount Eagle Park. Uh, for organizational purposes, when we've written the plan, we've uh, uh, we've modified that line so that it runs along the western edge of the Aventon. Uh, and so we've also updated this map color to reflect uh, the implementation of the plan's recommendations for Aventon as high density residential as opposed to a portion of it being implemented for mixed use. Uh, so that reflects the 379 units uh, that were um, that were rezoned uh, two years ago as a part of the Aventon. So that's an editorial change. Another one is to reflect the fact that uh, this portion of Mount Eagle Park uh, no longer has a, a plan recommendation for high density residential. It's, uh, it's, it's park property, and so we've updated that to reflect uh, existing conditions. Any questions on, on the land use map? That one's the easiest, <laughs> um, but we can um, happy to answer any questions that, that you may have about kind of the, the edits um, or what any of these specific things mean. Ellen, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question where you moved um, land uh, bay F. Mm -hmm. Does that then leave open where that house was proposed to be purchased along with all of the extra land and a bunch of townhouses put in? Or is that still in the plan now? Because that was a real problem for the Huntington uh, neighborhood. And I agree that it's a problem. Just to make sure that I, I know which property you're, you're talking about. Are you, are you referring to this property over here? Uh, within land unit B. Well, it was right on the yeah, it was right on the edge, um, and so now it shows that there's park going farther west behind that. Does so this does that protect that property from being developed or no? It wouldn't change it one way or the other. If it's if it's this area right here, as I'm showing right here, then right. this the changes here wouldn't have any change any change to the land use recommendations for that property. Okay. Because these these are outside. That that land area, if if we're referring to the same property, um, that area is outside of the TDA, and so this map does not um, it doesn't influence you know the the actual land use recommendations for that for that area. Um, that being said, this is the the change that we've made here is a cleanup to reflect existing conditions. So this clarifies that this area's plan recommendation is for parks um, on that you know on that um, park property. Any other questions? All right. The next map again 
um, adopted plan is on the left and proposed is on the right. This is our pedestrian circulation diagram. And so a couple of changes that take place here in terms of just to, to orient you, the key, we have modified the, the legend elements ever so slightly. As you'll notice, there's an error in the adopted comp plan uh, where both this line type as well as uh, this dashed as well as this solid line type are both labeled major walkways. Um, looking at this map, it, it, it's clear to us that this line is intended to be uh, sidewalks that are located outside of the TDA. It's all the areas in green. We actually don't see this line type within the TDA. And so we've made that change to reflect, um, again, the existing conditions that are on the ground. So this line type becomes sidewalk uh, and really is only applicable for areas that are outside of the TDA uh, and, and reflects existing conditions. The major change that we've made, a couple of major changes that we've made here, um, we've retained the major walkways uh, designation. Um, and then with this dotted line type, uh, we, we no, no longer using the term trails because that implies a specific um, you know, like asphalt or specific uh, type of, of walkway. Uh, rather, we use the term walkway. And that, that distinction between major walkway and walkway becomes, um, becomes important. Um, and I'll, I'll explain what it, what it really means in, in just a minute. Um, a couple of other things that we've added to this include the entrances to the metro station to show that there are two entrances to this specific metro station, one in the north end, uh, one in the south end, as those are kind of like the key focal points um, of the TVA um, in addition to the BRT station, so like the planned BRT station. Um, so we thought that it was important from, uh, from a map standpoint to show you know, how does this whole thing tie together. Um, the main point is that it ties um, the whole of the, the TVA together towards um, those, those metro entrances in particular. Um, regarding the other the other line types, major walkways. So major walkways are shown on this edge right here. And that's uh, circulating around uh, what's known as the S2 block. So that's one of the development blocks. Uh, major walkways are also shown along the North Kings Highway frontage. And then along the Huntington Avenue frontage, as well as these uh, areas in particular. Um, those areas are identified as the major walkways. Uh oh. Um, those areas are identified as major walkways, um, and that term is used in the text uh, to refer to areas that are of, of critical importance in terms of ensuring that you have uh, pedestrian circulation patterns that can go along those routes. And those are the areas where ground floor uses in particular uh, as a part of the mixed use project uh, would be identified as being appropriate. And so um, those areas in particular are ones where uh, we're really trying to achieve that, that type of urban form that's consistent with the TOD guidelines uh, and are the, the primary, areas, primary areas for place making opportunities. Um, walkways in particular, as you'll see, we've added walkways um, within uh, within the, the southern area. So you have walkways uh, in particular, the kind of the key, the key one that we've discussed at length has been this connection over to land unit I, I'll call it the inner parcel connection. Um, there's another uh, parcel connection across uh, the, the remnant parcel. Um, and then there are additional um, walkways within the northern parcel to reflect um, the you know, one way of, sh of laying out the grid of streets kind of in this area. Um, one other one that I'll that I'll point out there is a walkway that's shown along the side of the the platform property, and so we can we can talk about that in particular. Um, so that was one of the one of the, the comments that we received this um, this afternoon regarding both the inner parcel trail as well as the connection uh, through the platform. So uh, we can we can talk about that in particular. Uh, let's see, let's see other other changes that we have here. The other one is uh, we've added, um, as you can see, four plazas or other public spaces as those kind of key gathering points uh, and organizational points for the for the uh, for the Wamada property. So one of them is shown in this location immediately adjacent to the BRT station in the southern metro entrance. Um, one is located um, in the the area that's immediately adjacent to the courts at Huntington and Abington. And then one is shown shown currently on the um, the teardrop uh, shaped parcel uh, immediately adjacent to Lane Unit High. Uh, if, for those of you that followed the Huntington Club um, redevelopment, um, this was an area that was uh, kind of conceptualized as um, and referred to as uh, the Hounds Hill. Uh, so this is an area that's been thought of you know, in the coordination between those two developments as a, as a potential opportunity for a, a greater space than you might otherwise get on just uh, one property. Uh, and then finally, there's one plaza um, that's shown um, at the entrance to uh, the grid on the northern end, uh, immediately adjacent to Huntington Club. And so that's this map. And again, we'll 
we'll, we'll go back to this uh, when we talk about the text re related to pedestrian circulation, but wanted to be able to show you the before and after um, or the, the adopted and the proposed. Again, these can be revised uh, per, our, per our discussion, uh, but this is the, uh, one of the one of the more important changes that we've made is the pedestrian circulation uh, plan. Um, so I'll open it up for questions. We've got a couple here. Start with uh, Jason. Um, hi, yeah, I was have a question about the plaza that's in land unit G. Um, that, that's where that opening is where, at the Parker. And I know that someone was trying to put a building there, a mixed use building in that square. Does this plaza preclude then something being built there? Because the plans that we saw for the open space, it, it was not what I would consider a plaza there. That is a good question. I'm glad you pointed that out because um, the the intent with that plaza, this is a plaza that was actually added uh, in a recommendation by this this SSPA task force, um, and it refers not to the area where you have that temporary park space, but instead immediately adjacent to it. And so it's an area right next to Metroview Parkway, which is an area that's intended to be an urban plaza. But it's uh, to your point, it's uh, the 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 important thing was to um, to show that it was actually going to be immediately adjacent to this. So we'll, we'll make a, a change to the location of that plaza to reflect um, you know, the, the intended area for that, that place. But um, no, to your question, does, does the location of that um, prohibit the mixed use development? No, it's, it, it, was, it, it went in tandem with it. <laughs> um, so it's very much thought of as something that would be, uh, be there. And one of the reasons was because it was taking away um, uh, a space that was temporarily planned you know, to be parked and was implemented as a park. Um, but to to ensure that we still get you know, some open space in, in the urban um, in the urban area um, adjacent to it. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Holly. Thank you, Graham. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about the plazas. I I really like the addition of more, and I'm wondering who. It, who's responsible to construct and maintain those? Would those be built by the county or would those be proffers by developers that they'd be required to build and maintain? How does that work? And then my second question is, what is the difference between walkways and major walkways and sidewalks? Is it the width of the path or is there some other differentiation? I'll take that one first. Um, the sidewalk, sidewalk is only something that you see in the green areas. So those are the areas that are predominantly residential only uh, in their areas for the most part. And there, there are areas outside of the TDA. There's some areas over here that are planned for retail. Um, but those are areas that show existing sidewalks. So if you went down uh, down the street into the Jefferson Manor neighborhood, you'd notice that certain sides of the street have sidewalks. And so this map reflects that the location of those sidewalks. Yeah, in most cases, um, except maybe in, in a couple of locations, it's different. In most cases, they're fairly standard width um, sidewalk uh, and made out of concrete. Um, walkways is the term that we that we use within the TDA to refer to areas um, where we have either specific connection points and they might be trails um, or they might in some cases be sidewalks as well. Uh, but it's just noting that these are the areas within the TDA. It's the term that we use uh, and the exact material type um, is uh, is not specified. Uh, but it, it just notes that these are areas where you have um, walkways as connection points, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a sidewalk. It could be a trail in some cases. Um, that is different from major walkways. So major walkways are those areas in a couple of instances where we have uh, for this this area, for example, along uh, North Kings Highway and then along Huntington Avenue, the whole of the Huntington Avenue frontage, and then as well as a couple of locations within the site. Um, where those are the areas where you're really kind of intending to have the main pedestrian corridors. And so those are also the areas where we have language later on in the text, which we'll get to, where we encourage uh, ground floor uses, uh, specifically the types of ground floor uses that can kind of really contribute to the type of TOD environment that, um, that, we, that we think is appropriate for this, for this site. Um, so that, that really kind of focuses the direction, less, less so from just a, a walkability standpoint, uh, not just a walkability standpoint, but also a placemaking and urban design standpoint. So that's the main distinction between the three. Um, to your question regarding the, the uh, financing and uh, kind of the maintenance uh, responsibilities and, and ownership of these spaces, um, the details of exactly you know who would be 
uh, kind of responsible for maintenance in terms of uh, you know, the exact, um, you know, whether it's you know, uh, the private developer, uh, whether it's uh, WMATA, um, that, that type of level of detail we don't typically get into with, with the plan amendment. That being said, we do have language that encourages it to, to be private. Uh, and so I think that it's a, it's a, a, a good a good segue into something that we'll talk about uh, later on when we get into the text, but we do have language in the straw man that notes that it should be private. All right, uh, Mr. Vianne. Thank you, Graham. Um, just with regard to this, we sent in some comments earlier today. I don't want to take over. This is your presentation, so I don't want to kind of interfere too much with that, but I guess maybe at the end we'll be able to provide some counterpoints on this or things we but within our the material we submitted today is a in the urban design infrastructure plan, which is very similar to this you know, in terms of the, where the plazas and the wires are. We do have a couple comments. Just I'll be real brief uh, with regard to the. We're proposing essentially a minor plaza. Concept and that would be for the part near uh, the uh, Huntington uh, Huntington Club on uh, North Kings Highway. Be, in that you know basically half of that is already on the hunting club portion so making another part there or minor one there uh, the other one is down where the Aventon is uh, when we'd gone through with the Aventon project there was a the green space there connected you know it is going to be surrounded on all sides by roads we've got a we've had some history in the past of that not working too well and that was part of our concern with having a oh, green space right next to North Kings Highway up by up by Huntington Club too but the goal was really kind of to push back that sidewalk area to provide kind of a, a visual connection between Mount Eagle Park and areas kind of in towards where the uh, the metro station will be connectivity. So we're considering uh, proposing essentially having kind of an optional or a minor plaza there versus the major plazas being, you know, I think you've correctly noted the north and south entrances of the uh, metro station. And as the project builds up, perhaps somewhere else, but right now those would those would be the ones we think would be the focal point. And we've also proposed kind of an optional minor pathway uh and our, our biggest concern really is that that kind of lateral dot dotted pathway you have going from the southern entrance of the metro station to mid block of land bay i and you know without getting into a lot of detail right now we've, we've laid it out we can get into further on the conversation we get there there's a lot of logistical practical infeasibility questions we got with that and so we, we put that in the plans but with that i'll let you guys get back on your presentation All right. Um, thank you for that, Mark. And yeah, we can we can continue to to discuss that. I haven't had a chance to to digest the, right. the plans, but um, but we'll but we'll certainly talk about them further. Catherine, thank you. Um, the <clears throat> excuse me, the high flying walkway that you guys had designed before that's going from the north from the top to the bottom or vice versa is that anywhere shown in here on these walkway dots? I think you're likely referring to this one right here. So yes, this is the inner parcel connection to Lane Bay I, uh, which is described in the text. Um, so that's the thing that Lynn and I am now against, and Lynn certainly is against and has been forever. I think that's the one we want to talk about. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to make yeah, sure yeah, that's the one, whether no. it's yeah. here or not here. So it is here, and that's the one that goes from the metro down and then catches on to some other walkways of some variety. Okay, and yeah, yes. we need to talk about that. Yeah. Um, okay, that's really all I wanted to know. Thank you for clarifying. Ah. Oh, actually, there is one more question. And it's kind of tagged on to Holly's about who pays for, who maintains, et cetera, et cetera. If your intention is that all of these dotted walkways are there was going to be the responsibility of the developer. And what happens when the plans that the developers intend to bring forward don't fit in nicely with what you have here? You know, because there's a building in the way or there's trees in the way or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I mean, so a couple couple thoughts on that. The language, the language that we have in the comp plan draft uh, notes that it should be private. Um, I think in terms of the ownership, you know, maintenance responsibilities, et cetera, 
Um, the exact, you know, this is this is shown generally. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that you'll that, that we always come back to is that the plan is a guide. The plan is a recommendation for you know, the land use, um, the development of land uses. And so if there are things that are you know, proposed at later dates, um, it's kind of hard to, to say in a vacuum exactly how we would react in every situation. But, um, you know, the intention that we have here um, is described in the text. And so I think that between that and the map, you would be able to get a, an answer regarding um, you know, what, what it, you know, how it'd be interpreted relative to what's being proposed. Um, you know, for example, if, if you had a if you had a building uh, in this area, which has been described previously as the S3 block, um, it may very well, very well probably wouldn't be an, an exact straight line. It depends on a couple of things. One is, um, you know, should this path be accessible? We have language in the text that says that it should be. Um, so I think that if you had a path that connected from this grade point to this grade point, um, you'd likely see all things being equal, you know, a number of switchbacks. Um, so that's what's been shown previously. Um, if there is a, an opportunity to integrate some of this this walkway with an elevator system, for example, that was another idea that was um, that was explored, uh, considered um, with the, the S3 building, uh, then maybe this path doesn't need to go directly as shown here. Maybe there's some way of integrating it fully within the structure uh, of the S3 building. So that you have a walkway, uh, it just doesn't line up exactly with these points. So uh, it's kind of hard to say exactly, um, but since it, it'll depend, but um, the intent of connecting to land unit I, uh, as well as to the you know, the southern entrance to the station in that area of activity, um, that's that's the intent uh, is to, to make sure that you have that connection for um, kind of a, a host of reasons which we can get into, but. Okay, um, great. Thank yeah. you, Sam. That <laughs> clarifies and just to add that whenever we're going to have this discussion about that um, high-flying path, if you will, um, I'd like to have an in-depth discussion tonight about that and the, not the need for it because there's other options to get people from the top to the bottom. Yeah. And we'll come back to this, um, but I want to make sure that we got, got a chance to, uh, to show you kind of all, the whole of, of everything that we've got. So. Hold your thoughts on pedestrian connection in the in the inner parcel trail. We'll, we will come back to it. <clears throat> Another one that we wanted to hit on in particular, um, and, and really kind of make sure that we all uh, kind of understand, is the building heights map. Um, so one of the things I've described previously is that right now the adopted comprehensive plan does not have an explicit height limit for the metro station uh, property. Um, there, there's a reason for that, which is that uh, building heights. Um, for like mixed use development, residential development, commercial development are not planned in these areas. So the comp plan text um, really only kind of describes these areas as uh, planned for uh, public facilities. So there wasn't that wasn't that rationale at the time that you would need an explicit height limit. With the changes uh, that uh, that are proposed with the with the with the plan amendment, that does you know alter things. Um, so a couple of things that we've mentioned in the past is that um, 200 feet, as you can see, is uh, kind of the maximum height that you have. Uh, within the TDA, this being at the metro site, that seems to be an appropriate height limit for the majority of the site. Um, that being said, there are edge considerations when you're adjacent to um, lower density residential homes. And so the Huntington neighborhood, for example, uh, consists of duplexes um, and it's it's an area that's planned to remain as is. So uh, we want to make want to be sensitive to and kind of uh, ensure that the, the planning that we have for this area um, recognizes the, the contextual nature of, of this site. Uh, similar kind of consideration for across Hunt North Kings Highway um, on, uh, uh, in, in the Jefferson Manor neighborhood. And so we have two options that we wanted to show uh, for, um, for, for discussion. Um, in both instances, it's a 200 foot height limit for the majority of the site. Uh, in this area on the North Kings Highway frontage, you have a 55 foot to 200 foot uh, transitional height standard. And so what that does is you take a 40 degree daylight plane or bulk plane, if you will. And you shoot that up from the western side of the sidewalk. And so if you're if you're looking, if you're looking at the site from the other side of the street, uh, looking up, you begin at a 55 foot um, limit and then it would transition up into the site up until you get to that 200 foot maximum. So uh, that's the intent with this transition height area. Um, interior to the site, um, you have a lower height limit that's recommended in this area. Kind of in the southern portion, 
um, that is due less to uh, transitional building height considerations and more to the fact that this is immediately um, over the uh, tail tracks. And so it seems as though when, we, when we've talked to Lamada in the past um, that larger buildings absent some um, you know, significant engineering uh, may not be the best uh, for this for this particular area. So 85 feet um, is intended to ensure that we have uh, a consideration for a building height that would be um, compatible with the, with the tunnel. And then along the, the eastern edge of the property, uh, this is in the, another area, as I mentioned, of um, edge consideration given that you're up against uh, the Huntington uh, community and the duplexes that are immediately adjacent. So um, this is the area in particular where we've had um, some discussion about transitional height. So one um, option A that's shown here uh, would show an 85 foot um, eastern boundary. And this is option B, uh, and this would show a 55 foot um, eastern boundary. In both cases, we're dealing, you know, 55 feet would allow for probably up to about four stories uh, of either mid mid rise uh, multifamily, uh, potentially five, uh, four to four to five uh, stories of, of mid rise um, could allow for um, civic uses. Uh, and then not recommended under the draft plan text, uh, but one of the things that we've had had discussions with uh, Lamada at the previous meeting was about townhouses. And so I think in both instances, four to five, uh, four to five stories of mid rise uh, townhouses, civic uses could fit under that 55 foot height limit. Um, I think the question becomes, is this is this the right number? Um, and um, it, or is or is this something that's more appropriate? And so um, I'll open it up for discussion because I know that that's something that we've we wanted to kind of show and wanted to, to discuss with the task force. So I'll start. Holly, uh, I think you're at the top of the list. Holly, go ahead. Well, Graham, I'm sorry I forgot to take down my hand. Okay. Uh, Ellen, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so the eastern edge where you've proposed 85 or 55, you know, uh, foot height. I mean, that is right now a very narrow little row of mature trees that shields the uh, the townhouses on Biscayne from, you know, all the commercial development and the metro station. You, you say in the report says in several places that you want to protect stable neighborhoods. Well, this would absolutely destroy the homes on Biscayne. I mean, especially the ones closer to Huntington Avenue, because they now are have um, the Wesley towering over them on the east side, and then they'd have something towering over them on the back, and the home values there would be completely destroyed. So I don't see that as you know saving um, a neighborhood. And I, I thought buffer zones were kind of de rigueur when you've got residential you know, development. So I, I'm not understanding why we want to put big, tall buildings right on top of these poor little townhouses. So it, it makes no sense. And I think it is um, economically not viable. I think you'll end up having serious problems there. Okay. One, Ellen, one, one thing just to make sure that um, I've got, got so we can talk about the landscape buffer thing. Um, that area is also shown to have a landscape buffer. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be the exact width that's that's on the plan today with absent plan text, um, but the intent there is to ensure that you maintain a screen and that you maintain a landscape buffer between the duplexes um, and the and the TOD you know, kind of developed areas along it's, that. that it's not that wide. It's only maybe 30 feet wide there, and it's right next to on the other side on the west side of it is the driveway into the metro parking. I mean, it's just not wide. So I'm I'm just really not clear on how you're going to put townhouses there, um, unless you're just sticking it in the ground with no front yard, no backyard, and a couple of trees in between. It just or you know high rise. I just don't see it happening. The trees would have to come out because their roots would be damaged. So you'd, you'd end up with no trees, and you know a, a six foot tall tree that will grow in 20, 30 years is just not appropriate. So I'm just not seeing it. Mr. Biani. Uh, first of all, Graham, I want to say thanks very much for does that the the issue with the Huntington Club folks. I mean, the Huntington community folks uh, is an issue we raised at the last meeting. So I want to say, hey, thanks for thinking to us. Thanks for listening to us. And I know that the the landscape buffer is a new proposal too, as is the option B with 55 feet. I know Jason Zaragoza and that community is now engaged. So I'm not going to try to speak for them, but I it would seem that there's a solution there now with you know these various options here. So hey, thank you very much for that. 
B, where we've got right here uh, in the, I guess, the southern half, I guess, of Land Bay F, and we've got that kind of sweeping 200-foot recommendation, and then it goes down to 55 feet. I, I, I question whether or not we need the 200-foot or whether we want that anymore, given, you know, we have, we've got the pavilions down there, which are going to be, you know, basically they're developed at 55 feet, and you've got the, uh, the Aventon, and at least, you know, that portion of between the 200 foot and the boundary between 85 feet, maybe color that in a little bit of 85 because that's actually what the Aventon is. The Aventon there. So I just, you know, thought it might exactly, exactly just, you know, that or and maybe whether you even need to have 200 foot there because the Aventon project is, you know, well under 200 feet. And I don't think anything else within that 200 foot arc is going to get developed at 200 feet at this point. Last thing was, you know, just as we've done that kind of scaling up from the, and the ability to have a buffer and, you know, for a hunting community, the only other residential community that's immediately affected is the uh, the folks across North Kings Highway, you know, but they've got the buffer of, uh, of North Kings Highway on top of that. So I appreciate the 55 to scaling up to 200, you know, maybe that doesn't need to be as wide as it is, um, but maybe that could be abbreviated a little bit. You know, we think about what's to be proposed at Huntington Club at phase three, Directly adjacent at those will be some fairly tall buildings, but those are my three points with regard to uh, height and the like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think next, I see Catherine. Okay. Um, again, I'm not going to speak for Jason Zaragoza and the Huntington people. However, I agree with Ellen. An 85 foot building of any type with a few trees which will not grow in our lifetime is ridiculous to damage this um, conservation easement, if you will, community. So I would rather you nix any development on that small stretch and make it parkland, make it green, so you're not looking at an ugly metro station. And I'm, you're going to get enough development in here to satisfy the county's desire for more tax dollars. But I think you're just doing the wrong thing for this older community by having any kind of development along that stretch. Thank you. Mary? Yeah, what uh, what happened to the idea for a community center that was at one time discussed for that piece of land? So we have included in the language um, an inclusion for 10,000 to 15,000 square feet of community or senior center use. Um, the exact location of that use is, um, is flexible. Um, this was one of the areas that was identified as potentially being um, an area that um, when, when we had Dover Cole look at it, an area where an alternative to uh, townhouses could be considered that might provide that type of transitional, um, still still a use that would be um, transitional in terms of its overall height. Um, a civic center or of a civic community center use um, could be two to three stories and get that 10 to 15,000 square feet, which is uh, what um, NCS, or Neighborhood and Community Services Department, was saying is kind of the needed facility for the Huntington neighborhood um, given the kind of the, the age of the, the existing community center and so this is one one location um, where it could potentially go uh, and so that's um, that was thought of as an alternative use that could be potentially compatible kind of in that that this general area uh, down here um, if townhouses were were not uh, were, were not something that was being considered uh, so it's so it's still there uh, it's a it's a something that we think of uh, as something that could be explored further. Uh, there are other sites um, in Huntington that have also been thought of uh, as being uh, potential for community center or senior center use, uh, but it's very much still you know, part of the discussion. So are there any uh, residents from that area listening in on, on this discussion or engaged with this discussion? Um, I believe so. I think uh, Jason, I don't want to speak for you, but um, I think I actually have you next on the Next on the list, if you'd like to like right. to speak. Maybe. 
Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I was. I was looking at the. I was still <laughs> stuck on this. The this eastern boundary. I, I missed some of the discussion about the community center part there. I apologize. That's was quite all right. Yeah, we we were just we were just reiterating that you know, a community center use um, is included as a potential use in the comp plan uh, recommendations that have been uh, that have been put forward uh, to the to the task force. Um, it is something that's. Um, that it's one site among among many uh, within the Huntington area that uh, could be considered, um, but it's it's something that when we had our uh, consultants take a look at, you know, what what could be a potential use for this this area in particular, uh, as an alternative to a to a townhouse recommendation or a recommendation that would include townhouses, uh, that seemed to be something that would be compatible in terms of height, uh, given the use uh, the use that's or the size of the use that's needed, which is ten to fifteen thousand square feet. Yeah, and I mean, I guess if we're since that, I, I don't know if we're just moving to me, but I do regarding <laughs> this area. But you know, I, I want to just I appreciate Ellen, Mark, and and Catherine's comments on this. I think they said some of it better than I could have. But um, I mean, I do want to thank you for showing a couple of these options and for showing an option lowering it to fifty five feet. But um, you know, those. Those residents on Biscayne in particular have been through a lot in the past year and a half with the Arden construction just really disrupting daily lives and then the people at the top of the hill having to deal with the, the Aventon construction. I know I hear stories all the time that they hear they hear the hammer starting at 7 a.m. Um, and, you know, the, the people on that lower Biscayne just lost all the trees in front of them, um, you know, on the Arden. And I think that to lose the trees behind them would just be devastating. Um, and I, I, I just anything that we could do to, to keep this that as parkland, just that little strip, I think, would be huge. And I think, as Catherine mentioned, we still have plenty of other land back there that's slated at 200 feet and i think that to get the density in there by just protecting that little buffer there um so th that's all especially because a lot some of those homeowners on that side of biscayne they've been there for a long time and so you know i could see if you had townhouses that were built within here you know at least they would you could argue that they knew what was coming they know that some of this is coming i think some of the people who bought there you know had no idea that the all, all the trees that they you know were thought that they were gonna you know retire and are, are about to be taken out behind them yeah thank you for those comments and um Ellen, I think you're next. Yeah, I just I have a, a proposal. Um, I'm not sure that everybody understands what a very narrow little strip that is. It's really not appropriate for building, but the trees are fabulous. Can we all meet there, or everybody who can, so we can look and see? Because I don't know how many uh, staff people have actually looked at that little spit of land, but you know, it's enough to protect the townhouses but it's really not enough to have any buffer in buildings there. And I think if you actually saw it, you could understand that. And I think I think Jason would probably agree with me with that. We just, you, you'd really need to see it and how tiny it is and you just can't build, if that's possible. Yeah, I think we could, um, we could, we could certainly talk about it and see who can, if we can make something along those lines work. Well, I know, I know for, um, for a fact, uh, you know, Megan, Joanne, Tim, um, Bob, you know, kind of the main the main folks who have been working on this, um, Liz as well. We all have been to the site. Um, we've been kind of to that that landscaped area uh, immediately adjacent to the middle garage. Um, so we're definitely definitely know you know that you know the the trees are doing a good job there, um, and that that area is 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 sensitive and will need you know some specific you know, focus. Um, one thing I, I would mention. Um, regardless of 85 or, or 55, um, the the illustrative plans that we've been discussing um, is with with Wamada uh, and up to this point have only really looked at development and the development block um, in this area. Um, and so, and and that you know the illustrative that was that was put forward by Wamada included townhouses kind of in that in that area that's closest to Huntington Avenue. Um, I I haven't seen anything. Uh, and I don't think anything's been contemplated regarding kind of development in this upper area, for example. Um, the Abington does, uh, you know, which is under construction now, is is located kind of uh, approximately right here and down. Um, so that's a that's another consideration. But this is the area between the existing garage and those townhouses. So 
the viability of doing something in that specific area does seem kind of limited, um, kind of just from a how could you possibly even fit it in, let alone <laughs> make it compatible. <laughs> um, and so we could we could take another look at the language you know, about about that and, and see what what we need. The the other thing that we want to make sure that we have you know, kind of clear, though, is that they're, they're, the garage does come close to that 55 foot uh, limit today. Uh, the middle garage, especially along that edge. So just want to make sure that whatever we write into the, the plan text doesn't make that garage immediately a non-conforming <laughs> use should they come in for a, for a zoning action. Non-conforming in the sense of it has a plan recommendation at least that's uh, inconsistent with what, what was actually built. So but we, yeah. can, we can take another look at it. Yeah, I agree with that. As long as there is that tree buffer and those trees don't come down, uh, that would make me happy. I think it would make the homeowners on Biscayne happy because already the ones closest to Huntington are towered over on the east side. So it's just, you know, unacceptable. So, uh, Mary, go ahead. Mary, I think you dropped off. Yeah, yeah that oh. was a leftover. Sorry. Oh, leftover hand. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for this, um, Jason. I'm glad that you're here. Um, um ma'am, may yes. I? I raised my hand again. Go. It's Catherine. Uh, go ahead, Catherine. I don't, I don't see your hand, but go ahead. Well, anyhow, it says it's raised. Well, whatever. Question um, with respect to the community center option. And please correct me if I'm wrong. All of this new development that everybody is proposing, if I remember correctly, they have gyms inside of them, they have meeting rooms, they have all sorts of things for their individual development areas. So we're already existing within the Huntington community, albeit old and tattered, is a community center. So why would we not be interested in taking that existing space and building a new one in that location as opposed to trying to jam it in over here? That's my question. Yeah, I, I can't speak exactly to what to NCS's comment, but I think that the generally speaking, you know, that that site has constraints in terms of access, uh, in terms of its physical physical size. Um, that you know, given the the level of development that we have in this area, uh, kind of the, you know, the the additional need for senior uh, senior services as well as you know, community center uh, uses, you know, makes looking at other types of uh, looking at other areas within the kind of the immediate surroundings um, potentially a better option. Um, I, again, I can't speak for NCS. You know, it's it's their you know, it's their their type of facility, but um, they've been. Uh, they, they've let us know that they're they're looking for you know, other options for the long term, uh, and so again, this is this is looking at a long term plan, uh, and that this would be a potential you know, the Wamata property writ large uh, is one one potential place given that there's so much redevelopment potential that's being considered uh, for that community center use, uh, but it's not the only one. Uh, I know that we had a similar discussion about the Parker um, as a, as another via, you know, potentially viable option for at least some of that square footage. Um, and so they've NCS has indicated that that the current space is uh, is constrained, and so it's, it's looking at kind of outwards you know, the, at the broader um, opportunities in the area. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So we'll come back to this, um, but related to it is the open space and landscape buffers diagram, and so a couple of changes of notes. Um, one's editorial. We filled in the rest of Mount Eagle Park to reflect uh, the you know, the implementation of the park um, within the within this area. Uh, so that's that green hatch area. Um, we are showing a landscape buffer along the eastern edge, uh, adjacent to the Biscayne uh, facing homes, and then consistent with the cert pedestrian circulation map, which we had shown two maps ago. Um, we're showing the three. Uh, plazas and open spaces, uh, plazas and public spaces rather, uh, in the southern portion of the site, and then one in the northern portion. So, with, and I know we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but any any further thoughts on this particular on this map? Because that's um, that, that's it for this one in particular that we've that we've shown.
No, I'm just happy to see more green space and plazas. We are too. It's better. All right, so those are the maps. Again, we'll I'll show them again when we get to the specific areas where we've uh, where we've amended the plan text uh, in response to the, the previous uh, task force discussion. Uh, but now I wanted to show you the red line, uh, red line edits. Um, so land use to eat, relatively simple, um, consistent with what we've described already in the land use plan. Uh, we've relocated um, parcel 83338C, um, which is the Aventon. Uh, we've located that in land unit F. So we've kind of taken it out of land unit E, put it in land unit F. It's an editorial change uh, to reflect that it's been implemented. Um, regarding the land unit E's uh, transit oriented mixed use option, which is the, the main focus of the, the plan amendment, um, we have made one change, and that is regarding the uh, description of ground floor non residential uses. Um, so, as you'll recall, we have broad flexibility regarding. Um, excuse me, non-residential uses, so um, office, retail, education, community service uses, um, different types of housing that are regulated as non-residential healthcare, healthcare type uses. Um, one thing that we were more specific on was the uh, the total amount of uh, ground floor uh, uses. And so this is going back to that Dover Cool discussion that we had um, over the fall where we're looking at you know, what would be the kind of the viability uh, the southern portion of the site in particular, but as well as the northern portion, um, and how would how could how could that be enhanced by the provision of ground floor uses? And so, that 20,000 uh, 20, square feet in the southern portion, fourteen thousand in the northern portion, was thought to provide that type of mixed use environment that we we're that we we're you know, envisioning for the site, um, and could also fit given the block pattern in the illustrative plan that was proposed. Um, so one thing that we've uh, noted, and this is in, in discussions, you know, with, at the at the task force as well as follow up discussions with Mata, uh, is that you know what are we really kind of getting at here? Um, and one of the things that we you know really you know, kind, of, kind of took to heart was this idea that maybe it's less uh, less about the exact number, and maybe it's more about the type of environment that can be achieved. And so, uh, if, for for example, if if a if a plan comes in. And there's, you know, they're, and they're slightly under that 20,000 square foot, you know, say by a couple thousand square feet. Um, but it's otherwise still implementing kind of the, the main objectives uh, and the main, uh, the main vision that's described in this uh, plan option. Would that be okay? And so one of the things that we've taken away is, yeah, probably um, if it's kind of achieving the, the goals of the, of the chapter, but it's slightly shy of the, the, the minimums. Um, I think that generally speaking, um, that, that in and of itself shouldn't be a denial issue. Um, so we've added language to that effect. I'm saying that minor deviations in square feet uh, may be considered if a development plan achieves the, the goals set forth um, in the, the building forms and activating street furniture section, which is the, the section that really speaks to urban design, kind of the, the, the vision for the, for the site. Um, any questions on that one? Um, this is going to sound like a really dumb question, but what's the difference between major walkways and walkways? Sure. So major walkways are those areas where we uh, really want to see that type of mixed use environment. So um, the ground floor uses, for example, um, are really intended to be located along those major uh, major walkways. May not be the entirety of all those major walkways. For example, you know this is a whole block pattern, uh, fully surrounded on all sides. We recognize that you know, service uses will need to be located somewhere, uh, but these are the areas where, generally speaking, you want to have those types of active um, active frontages, ground floor uses, and those would be located along those areas that are shown in dash as opposed to the dotted areas. Um, so that's the distinction that's kind of important for the purposes of this this map as well as in the chapter. Um, so major walkways and those are the areas where pedestrians circulate through the site uh, to get to either the BRT or the metro entrances um, or to get to you know, the ground floor uses uh, that would be more public in nature. Uh, and the, kind of the, the main placement and opportunities. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Vian. Uh, thanks, Graham. Uh, with regard to that prior slide, we've had, we just added a, in the WMATA comments. We added a couple of feedback, a couple of comments just regarding clarifying the acreage and a couple of the, you know, the, the references for the uh, parcel numbers in there, all kind of non-substantive edits, just clean up there. 
uh, with regard to the language here, it says a minor deviation to the square foot. We just proposed it said, we, you know, our thing is just a lesser amount of square feet, maybe. And just instead of minor deviations in, in yeah, cause that sounds a little, little kind of prejudicial. And you think about well, looking at this later on, you know, another planner may look at this, say this is a deviation to minor. What is minor? We just say lesser amount of square feet and the rest of it the same. That was what we thought might be focus being basically as long as you're achieving the plans the goals you know you should be allowed to move forward thank you thank you mark holly thank you graham i i really like the idea of of to, you know putting flexibility into the plan uh <coughs> excuse me because you know, we don't know when all of this is going to be developed or what the market will be like then, but to allow flexibility, I think is a great uh, feature of of this plan. Any other thoughts on this section? Um, one, one thing I would just note, you know, I think that uh, Mark, had, I know we, we had talked about kind of the, the term minor you know, in the past and mm -hmm. uh, kind of given that idea of like, well, maybe a couple of thousand probably isn't a big deal. Um, from from our standpoint, you know, to this, this describes that uh, one, one point, which is that it still has to be kind of a mixed use environment um, and it would still need to have you know, a substantive amount that's pretty darn close. Right. Um, and I think that you, you I think without putting words in your mouth, I think you would agree with that. <laughs> Generally oh, I, speaking. I, yeah. You're not putting words in our mouth. I think we do agree. I mean, yeah. our, our, our concern, I, I like, I, I appreciate you guys listening to us. Yeah, and I think yeah, you're just, are, we literally agree on the same thing. Is basically that you have this 20,000 or 14,000 square foot level, but you might be able to go what, somewhat less than that if you're achieving. And I think you guys have said, and you're, you're building forms and you're activating street front section. I think you've done a really good job illustrating what the goals are. I'm literally just saying instead of minor deviations in, replace it with lesser amount of, and that's it. So it's just, I, I'm looking at it purely from the standpoint of just, you know, from a regulatory standpoint that's happening, not in the context of having debated this in the context, in a comp plan. You know, when I see minor deviations, people take, you know, it, it, it's very subjective and people say, well, you're getting an exception or something like that. And, you know, and there's a bias against it that may be, not helpful. So I just said, set of minor deviations in lesser lesser amount of, and the rest of it the same. But we like what you did. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Listen, listen. All right, uh, Catherine, I'm sorry, your hand. I'm going to agree with Mark here because the comp plan is supposed to be the people's plan. We keep fighting about this year after year after year. And we don't want to go into gibberish with lawyers and arguing over things. So the simpler, the better. So please do what Mark asks you guys to do. Thank you. Um, well, uh, Holly, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to lower. It's okay. No, no worries. Um, so j just so y'all are kind of aware, I, from our standpoint, the the twenty thousand uh, in particular, which has been you know, kind of the the main subject of our kind of our thoughts, given that you know, a lot of the discussion has been on the southern phase. Um, staff really really thinks that that twenty thousand um, is actually probably at the lower end of what would be you know, getting at that type of mixed use environment that we're after. Um, Dover Coal had kind of looked at this and they thought. You know, more you know, on the order of probably about 14,000 in, in addition to the 20 would probably be what it would take to get that kind of critical mass of, of activity um, and you know, really kind of get that that environment that we're going after. And so that 20,000 from our standpoint is already quite flexible in the context of 1500, uh, 1500 units over the whole of the site, uh, but certainly about 1000 units, which I think has been generally speaking about what's been proposed across the southern portion. So 
Uh, we think of that as something that's critical in terms of ensuring you have a mix of uses and that you're getting that that streetscape. Um, I think we can always you know look at the exact language, but um, our our, th our thinking has been that there, there's a lot of flexibility <laughs> here already. Um, so that's that's our kind of our thought process on it. Uh, Mary, go ahead. Yeah, I, I really like the mixed use concept. I think the neighborhood is better if it has more retail and more useful retail. Um, people could need to shop and don't have to go elsewhere for. So I, I support your efforts to get more of that into this development. I think especially a, a transit development, a development at transit should supply a lot of the needs that people in that area will have. And I don't know why the developers think they can't make money off of that right now, but I think eventually they will. I don't know. I don't know the market, but I know that the um, end result should have a lot of small retail and other services. I think some of the things that we're juggling at Metro is obviously the financial aspects of, of the retail market these days, but the site, while it is accessible by transit, is very um, constrained from a vehicular standpoint with all these different grades and limiting the you know number of accessible points and we have had concerns at other metro stations with similar characteristics to this um, where the traffic congestion that retail ended up generating impacted transit customers or ended up impacting um, the community because there wasn't enough points of ingress and egress to that retail um, from a vehicular standpoint. So I think that there is somewhat of a um, tight rope to walk. Uh, Mary, go ahead. Yeah, so I think we're talking about like 5,000 new, I don't know if it's residents or families or 5,000 new units. Um, and that's kind of a lot of extra people to service. So plus whatever ha whatever density increase there is at Huntington Club. So I don't know how you kind of match up population with numbers of population with need for services, but it's looking at a very different landscape uh, that we're planning for than the one we have now in terms of population. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Mary. I mean, it's a, the, the total number that's considered for the metro property is 1500 um, units. So I, I don't know the exact translation in terms of kind of projected families, but you know, several several thousand. Um, one other kind of point that uh, I'll just kind of reiterate and I'll stop <laughs> is um, when the EDA had done their analysis of you know what of, of commercial development and projected commercial development um, in, through 2030 um, of this of this particular area of the of the of the county, um, they had noted that this this area um, had a potential for about 50,000 uh, net new square feet of of retail. Um, so not just on the WMATA property, but also throughout the TD, you know, the, the Huntington area, Pendaw, uh, North Gateway. Um, but I would also mention that this one site, and, and only this site, uh, was noted in their recommendations as an area where you'd have real potential for retail. Um, so it, I would just, it, I, I know everybody, you know, wants to see a mixed use development happen on this on this property. Um, I would just say that you know, this is a, a real opportunity site. Um, as identified by the EDA um, for for this type of thing, so um, I'll just I'll just mention that. Um, but um, I know that there, there seems to be a lot of um, there's a lot of opinions on this, so I want to make sure everybody has a chance to talk. So, Mr. Vian, go ahead. I was going to say I think you know I don't think anybody's I think we're all kind of envisioning the same thing. I really do. And when you look at here, you know the language we have here. You know, I appreciate Graham writing the language he did and listening to us. And, you know, he's saying minor deviations and we're saying lesser amount of, I mean, really, I think we're all envisioning this is kind of a tomato tomato thing. You know, we're just looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, a follow up regulatory 
perspective. Uh, but yeah, I don't know that this requires this much debate. We got a lot of the other things to go on to get through this plan. But yeah, I just I just want to just give a little perspective here that really I think we're all kind of everybody's kind of saying the same thing. We're just looking at it from a standpoint of when I'm taking a zoning case through or something like that. You know, maybe some space that you might be considered non-residential, you know, is actually because it's the first floor of an apartment building is going to be considered residential, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, that, that that's really what I think we're talking about for right now, this conversation. We're just talking about three words that essentially are tomato, tomato versus saying the same thing. We're just I don't know how much more discussion this this point is worth. Yeah, I, I, what I agree with one with one thing, which is. I think that there is an important uh, distinction between an environment that's publicly oriented, not truly non-residential in character, uh, mm -hmm. that has ground floor activated uses that are open and available to the public, uh, compared to one that has amenities um, for residential on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. Those are two very different types of environments. Uh, one of which, you know, both both of which are you know fine in their own regards and kind of in isolation, but for an, you know an area that's so critical. Um, I think that we really want to be yeah. pushing as much as we possibly can for that that former. Uh, Hillary, go ahead. Uh, yeah, completely different subject. Um, is climate change taken into consideration in any aspects of this project? We uh, will we'll show you a couple of um, a, a couple of things that we have included in here regarding green building, uh, regarding uh, environment. Landscape buffers, um, so not by not by name, um, but I think the intent with regards to uh, green building in particular is, is one we can one we can discuss. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Levine. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just want to get back to your the point you just made uh, about I guess the public versus non-public uses of these um, amenities. Do you feel like this? optimizes, I guess what you're saying, the public, um, kind of public facing uh, activities and facilities, you know, on, on the space. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yes, correct. We're, we're getting the intent of this bullet down here. And we have some descriptions later on about exactly kind of what we what we're looking for in that space and those in those types of spaces. Oh, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. But the idea here is that these would be kind of public oriented spaces. So restaurants, you know, um, retail establishments, services that aren't necessarily retail, uh, gyms that are, you know, open, open and available to the public, th those kinds of things that are public facing, um, but are commercial, um, but are not. And th the distinction being that it wouldn't be something that's only available as an amenity to, um, you know, a residentially anchored building, for example. Uh, so like a gym, a gym that's available to the public versus a gym that's internal and private, you know, to the to the resident, the residents only. And just to thank you for that, Graham, I, I appreciate that. Um, and just getting back to Mary's point about the Huntington Club development, which is going to be, I, I imagine it's it's going to be pretty uh, intensive, uh, and so you, you're going to see a lot of intensive development here. Um, but I'm just wondering, are, is there some consideration given to that in terms of, I mean, given the amount of retail that will be there, and then you have the amount of retail here, I mean, is it, is there some thought given to whether it's, it's duplicating, whether it's, you know, sort of in sync one with the other, you know what I mean? I think um, in terms of du duplication, uh, no. Um, what we've been trying to do is try to connect those areas where you have, you know, retail that's proposed in Huntington Club, which is mostly located on the Huntington Avenue side to the southern portion so that you'd have that kind of more critical mass and you'd have the ability for people that are, you know, living at WMATA and, and living at Huntington Club to be able to, you know, go between those two because uh, those are kind of important nodes. Uh, but no, we, we haven't been looking at it in terms of you know, would there be deprecation. I think it's um, the timelines for both are so different. Um, that, that that hasn't been a consideration. Uh, right. Tim, go ahead. All right, just a question. This is much for the consultants as anybody. Just wondering, as we look at density, as we look at, you know, uh, on-site versus off-site um, 
trips to the to the retail office, whatever whatever we're looking at in terms of amenities. How much does the the density surrounding that within that area, the height, the building scale, influence or not external visitors to the site? No, you know what, you know, we think of mosaic and we think of it as, and, and it's not an apples to apples comparison, but it's the only thing I could think of at the moment. We we think of, um, and we've heard this, it's a neat place to go. Well, that's that's a pretty, that's a complimentary thing to say about a site you don't, where you don't live, where you don't visit frequently, but you, you find it attractive when you go there. Uh, it has greenery, it has um, level, you know, it has level sites, has a lot of nice restaurants, amenities, things like that. And the buildings in general are not that tall. And I'm being very general here. Um, what is the influence of the height and scale of the size to, to getting your outside external visitors to the site? I just, I'm looking for some thoughts or opinions, nothing specific. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure so much about heights in particular, but I can speak specifically to ensuring that we have that mix of uses. Mm -hmm. um, but having having additional you know, residential density you know, in these types of locations is very much thought of as supporting kind of the, the non-residential side and, vi and vice versa. Um, more specifically, um, and I know we'll want to move on in just a minute, but Bob, do you, do you want to talk about how that, that works from a TDM standpoint and also from just like a trip generation and internal capture kind of standpoint because uh, this is this kind of gets at what was studied as a part of the TIA and so I want to be able to, uh, to to answer your question a little bit more technically. Right, Tim, uh, Bob Pecora, FCDOT. Um, last time we talked about the transportation uh, analysis, we talked about uh, a, a the trip generation uh, that the site might use. So. Uh, what was analyzed with that one was 47,000 square feet of retail space. So it's at, at the very higher end of it. But we, but since this is on a transit station area, we're able to look at a um, a trip reduction credit of 45%. So, or looking at internal capture where the uh, the trips that are generated are uh, people that are going from one building to the other. They don't. They're not getting in a car to drive to that facility or that use. Uh, so that helps with a credit in the amount of trips that are generated for on the um, streets on the street network around it. There's also something that we use as what's called a pass by. So people are passing by the area, let's say on Huntington Avenue or North Kings Highway, and they say, hey, there's a there's a store there. There's retail. I can go in there, pick up something and then get back on the road. So we're also looking at that and there's a, a certain percentage of uh, trips that are accredited for that uh, kind of retail use. So we look at that on how it influences the road network and we built that in with the traffic analysis uh, or what uh, what the analysis uh, put in there. So there's credits that we can, we're looking at how any of the uses that are being proposed here. And we looked at the fire, very higher end for retail space not 20,000 or 14,000, but we looked at the higher end, which would generate uh, a lot more retail trips and how that might influence the uh, the uh, adjacent road network. Having a lesser amount of non-residential will actually reduce the amount of trips on the road network uh, because of it's not what we studied. It's less than what we studied. Maybe that answers your question, Tim. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of just getting to the aesthetics of the site and how that will in, um, in, encourage, influence uh, external visitors to the site because it's going to be a pretty amazing site when it's done. But right. if it's if it feels like a monolith, if you're if it feels and looks like a monolith site, a monolithic site with you know very tall surrounding cavernous buildings, mm -hmm. I, I'm it's. This is purely purely aesthetics in terms of attracting external visitors. Right, and it could be, uh, it depends where, what the attractive uh, use is, whether it's on mm -hmm. North Kings Highway or Huntington, that influences what yeah. happens on those two roads. We don't know yet, we don't, we only have a concept that uh, the applicant team has pr provided to us. We don't have an actual program for all the, where all the uses are gonna be yet. Got it. But, but okay. Tim, to, to your point, I think we could, we could look at some language regarding um, 
variety of building heights. Mm -hmm. um, because one thing that we've we've shown in the in the height maps is maximums. Um, yeah. And that's you know kind of a blunt, a relatively blunt instrument. You know. Um, yeah. More to your point, which is how do you bring people into the site? That that's a you know critically shared goal for everybody. <laughs> Um, and I think that to your point, you know, form and, and height uh, and to a degree materials probably all kind of influence yeah. you know, the, the permeability uh, and the, the welcoming kind of nature of the development. So we can take this back and, and look at some language about that. Um, that's not okay. limiting in the sense of, you know, we're, we're shortening, shortening heights where we otherwise work, uh, all things being equal on the, on the main front, frontages, but yeah. something that's discussing permeability and trying to ensure that there's a variety of forms. Uh, that and, and maybe to Bob's point where you look at, you know, the ingress egress areas um, might be might to, and I'll defer to you guys might suit that that uh, that attractiveness of the buildings and the aesthetics. So just I think combining with what Bob was saying, what you're saying might be useful so that it, this is a vibrant area um, that doesn't just rely on people within the site. Big time. And we do have, um, we actually have two of our um, urban design uh, section revitalization folks on the call right now. Joanne, would, do you want to add anything kind of regarding this kind of this area? Yeah, this kind of sure. Realm, so to speak. <laughs> well, a couple of things. I, I, it's a good point, Tim. I think there's, it's and what we're getting at is maybe a couple different questions. You know, in terms of uh, retail experience and the sort of pedestrian realm, you know, people tend to not perceive the upper floors of buildings when they're walking around and that kind of mm -hmm. experience. So you know, taking great care in what happens on the ground floor and just making sure that there's good light and air that travels all the way down to the to the ground plane is, is part of that. Things like street trees and all of that kind of ground level experience is really what contributes to it. Yeah. And I remember last meeting, someone mentioned, you know, is this going to be like Mosaic District? And Mm -hmm. The challenge here is that has hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of square feet, uh, like more than half a million. We're yeah. talking about a very small amount here. And, and as we get lower and lower and it becomes more and more residential, as Mary aptly pointed out, it, it becomes less and less of a public realm. And these spaces, the public spaces that are adjacent to these residential uses start to feel more like um, public spaces only for those residents. Um, it, it, if you have you gone to places like Fairfax Corner or yeah. you know Mosaic, they they have those commercial uses that makes you feel like you are you are welcome into that space. So you need that exactly. synergy of uses. Yeah. It's exactly and twenty thousand yeah. is such a small amount. We're talking, you know, this is really talking about like a Trader Joe's and a small yeah. restaurant. Or <laughs> I like was thinking four of Trader small Joe's. Restaurants. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's very yeah. minor. I mean, you know, and, and they showed examples, um, Dover Cole in the March presentation of a 40,000 square foot that would be much more, much more like a mosaic um, on this smaller scale. Um, so that's why we thought that, you know, the 20,000 was a, uh, a sort of bare minimum to get at that experience. Okay, all right. Well, I appreciate it. But I agree that we need to look at building heights and make sure that there's enough ver variety that it doesn't look like a monolith. So got it. That that'd be. I think that'd be helpful. Thanks, uh, Catherine. Thank you next. Yeah, I would just like to, to make a couple comments. I was the one who mentioned uh, Mosaic District. Right now, if you don't have anything, as Joanne says, and it's just like the neighborhood grocery store, you're not going to get people coming here because there's nothing of value for them to come for. They can easily go over to Eisenhower Avenue, they can go into Old Town, and then go to Mosaic District. But if you guys will remember, years ago, Street Sense came up with a concept called Vibrant Streets. All of Huntington Avenue, from tip to toe, needs to be established as a vibrant street. That brings people. And North Kings Highway, the same way. So for those of you who don't know the concepts of vibrant streets, I would encourage you to go back and read about it and consider it when you talk about development all along those two major roadways. That's what's going to bring people in. Thank you. And Catherine, if you could, um, if you have a copy of the of the report, we'd, we'd love to take a look at it and, and those that haven't been able to, to read it, um, just to kind of see how it compares. 
Uh, I, I know for I, I know I'd like to be able to see it because I, I have it, Graham. I can yeah, share it okay. with you, and if you want to share it with the task force, we did pay for it. Hopefully, they're okay with us sharing, but <laughs> we paid for the copy. Yeah, it's, it's been on their website for years. It was a study, as you know, they did for DC because the DC economic development people asked them to, why were some streets more active and why others were not. So it is a really good tool that everybody in the planning department of this county needs to be aware of. Uh, and from Metro's perspective, we 100% support these ideas. They're the path for ridership. And apologies, they had two boys running around. Um, you hear them in the background, Father's Day, woohoo. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think we would just note that those examples we talked about are so successful because there's a major partnership with the community and the jurisdiction to transform the right of way. And I think that's the most challenging part um, in this context is getting rubbed up against the traffic study and traffic analyses where these great streets uh, usually have lower vehicular throughput, what makes them great streets for people. <laughs> um, and, and trying to, to balance that. So I think that's where we all collectively have to come together to um, just agree on an acceptable threshold. Tim, I think you're next. Oh, I need to put my hand down, I bet. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm just doing a time check, it's 8.10, and I know we've been focusing a lot on this this one particular thing. It's probably the, the biggest thing, <laughs> uh, or at least one of them. So I'm glad we had this discussion. It's really good. Um, I, I appreciate all the comments and, and including Catherine's on the Vibrant Streets report. That's good to know. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move on and, and, and flip through a couple more slides just to make sure that we can get get through it because I know some folks might might need to drop off at 830. Um, but this has been a, a good discussion and uh, again, yeah. Mark, Mark, thank you for your for your edits, uh, your suggested edits, and others from the task force. If you have specific things, um, we will again be you know, producing a, you know another synthes synthesized uh, straw man. So this is this is good. So thank you. Okay, uh, minor change here. This is editorial in nature. Uh, the existing plan, uh, the the existing straw man had uh, a a typo regarding a two hundred room hotel. Uh, thank you, Mark, for pointing that out. Uh, we've removed that so that it's uh, a general recommendation of flexibility regarding hotel uh, being able to be uh, considered in lieu of either dwelling units or residential intensity. Uh, the exact uh, kind of ratio would be would be determined to be subject to a traffic impact analysis. design framework um, we'll, we'll we'll look at this in particular Tim regarding kind of the, the comments that you had about uh, height and form and permeability um, the one thing that we wanted to come back to was uh, parks and open space specifically looking at the the trail over to or the walkway excuse me over to leaning at I um, so the language that we had uh, previously um, is shown shown here have been talking about natural areas plural of the site for passive recreational open space such as along the interpartial walkway to lane and I. So that's the trail that's described. And so one of the things we noted is that this is actually the only area that's really kind of uh, you know, an area of uh, natural area that's really kind of thought of as being a place where you could have that potential passive recreation open space type use. Um, and so rather than just having you know, general language about it, we wanted to make sure that we would be more explicit about the lane and eye connection. Uh, we've replaced the term trail with walkway uh, so that the, the exact type of surface, for example, isn't inferred. So that's a relatively minor change. It also links up with the terminology we use in the, in the TDA maps. Uh, and then we, we've added language uh, that this, you know, this connection intended to promote active mobility, specifically you know, between North-South as well as between Huntington Club and Lamata. Health and well-being, you know, linking that to our, our, um, our shared understanding of you know of health uh, and ways that the built environment can influence health, uh, and then also um, having language there about you know, access to pass passive recreation within this area. So it's not just not just about the commute; um, it's also about you know, ensuring that you have a way of you know, recreating from within the area. I'll go back to this because I, I know that the the image this this image in particular 
you know, was was the one that I think Kathy and you had, you had talked about uh, in, your, in your comments. So um, I can we can open it back up, you know, regarding this. Um, and Mark, I think your hand was up first. Yeah, I was just going to respond. Go back, and let me know if you want to flip back to the. To, to no, actually, this, this one's good here. I mean, right. what I was going to respond is, you know, and again, you know, we, we've, we've talked about the our, our comment about the minor plazas. Uh, really, it's this one. This is this is this this connection. When you consider that you're going to have folks from Huntington Club are going to have ability to walk directly along Huntington Avenue to over the metro station. They're going to have the ability to get right where that pedestrian connection is, you know, where they kind of have the stair, little stair step connecting with the southern entrance where the kiss and ride is. You have the ability to walk on North Kings Highway and you have the ability to walk, you know, kind of cutting in a little bit further, kind of where that little plaza is there. You know, that, that's four connection points. This proposed connection point only goes right to the dead center of, of Lamb Bay Eye. So it really only serves the future residents of Huntington Club. It goes through the only kind of naturally preserved area. And that area is not just naturally preserved with older trees and the like, but that's an area where it's almost a 45 foot drop, if not 50 feet. And so we're looking at, okay, so you're going to have kind of this, we talk about having something that's kind of more accessible. So you're going to have kind of a windy pathway that's elevated. Well, that windy pathway is going to have to switch back and forth, you know, in order to be accessible, taking out more trees as you go through the conservation area. Those trees will have to be replaced elsewhere. Uh, that pathway is going to have a question of, do you like that pathway? Do you not like that pathway? Who pays to repair, maintain, or patrol all this thing? Metro police are going to have a real concern with this. Uh, and much like a bridge that freezes before the ground, you know, that thing in inclement weather, how is that thing going to be maintained safe? And do you really get a lot for that? And I guess, you know, our thought is if that's going to be something that we consider, that seems to be something that maybe it's looking at, we got to identify a funding source. Maybe that funding source is maybe the Huntington Club portions when they come forward over there, since they're going to be benefiting from it. Or maybe it's part of, a you know, another infrastructure package that maybe we talk about, you know, you know, through a funding mechanism with the county, either a TIF or a bond or something like that. But there are questions basically of safety, security, you know, functionality, how much money you're getting, how much how much use you're really getting for that, you know, and then the offsetting impacts of, you know, to the natural environment. Yeah, you know, if we want to have that for passive recreation or observation, you can get that from that pathway that goes right along the property line. You can get that from around the periphery of it. It, it, there's nothing all this does is really kind of just kind of put up a, a structure that's going to have to be maintained and patrolled and secured and cleaned and you know made shoveled off with snow and stuff You're right through the middle of it i don't know that you get much out of it um oh i, I want to be able to respond um but i know that Catherine, you had some comments as well so before we before we respond to Mark's, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I did send my note. I think everybody probably read it. And initially, I thought this design was really cool when your um, designer <clears throat> showed it. But in retrospect and thinking about it, the destruction of trees is unacceptable. <laughs> As Mark mentions, the safety issues related to not only if it freezes and you have ice patches, but in the fall, because there will be some trees still around and you get wet leaves. So what we're going to end up here with is a very, very expensive danger zone that, as Mark says, provides little benefit to anybody. If it is being used and the concept of being able to get from north to south, we already have options to get from north to south or top to bottom, whatever you call it. And that's through the metro itself. And for those people that are um, with disabilities, they can use a metro card. It doesn't cost a thing. They can go up on the elevators or escalators and they can move around the site that way. Huntington Club has also designed within their proposal we've seen is access through their buildings and elevators to move people up and down steep uh, grades. So I think this concept needs to be thrown in the trash and removed and that the natural environment be absolutely left alone. And I personally will be pushing the Mount Vernon Council to move in that direction. And I think our environmental committee will support that, getting rid of this little design. Thank you. Mary.
I'd like to hear Chris and a little bit more. We talked earlier about a, a way to connect north and south, and um, I'd like to hear you present this a little bit more and the internal metro escalator. Um, I I still, as someone who uses a walker, I'm not sure I see a way from north to south. I like the idea of connectivity through the neighborhood and through this particular development. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to hear it explained a little bit more so I can understand whether it works for everyone. Sure. Uh, so I'd, I'd be happy to to say a couple of things. Um, I know Joanne would probably like to say a couple of things as well. Uh, this has been kind of a a main focus of ours, you know, for the um, for the metro station uh, plan and in particular. So there's a couple of uh, high level points. There's kind of two main uh, main purposes that we see that this this connection could serve. One is that north south connectivity. So tying the northern portion of the site you know, located along Huntington Avenue kind of this this area and then the broader TDA uh, together with the southern. So the, the area along North Kings Highway. And so you have that kind of TDA wide need for a connection. Um, there is the, the planned connection um, that connects in right here over to Huntington Club. Uh, that's that's proffered as a part of the Huntington uh, Club uh, redevelopment. They also show this connection, which uh, is uh, not accessible as far as I know. There's stairs uh, along portions of this uh, that will take you from from that point here up. I think that's called the um, the Rocky Run Trail for those of you who are familiar with the Huntington Club neighborhood. Um, but one thing you'll notice, it doesn't tie in to the dual motto station property proper. Um, what it does, it, it brings you up to North Kings Highway and then from there you'd circulate back in uh, towards towards Metro. Um, so the other kind of main thing that this does is it provides a more uh, direct path of travel, which um, for, for all, all of us are, you know, it's kind of the intuitive thing, but you know those connections that are most direct are the ones that are going to be intuitively the ones that are going to be used the most. Um, the other thing that it really does is it ties together the two main nodes of the TOD uh, transit oriented development kind of concept for the whole of the TDA uh, together in a way that the other connections really don't. Um, and so I say that the 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 commercial portions of the uh, hundreds of cloud area are located kind of in this in this realm. Um, the commercial portions could be tent on the Wilmata property or potentially going to be located along Huntington Avenue and along this, this section here. Uh, but that, you know, it's 15 years down the line. So in terms of having connections between between these nodes, um, this area in the southern portion is really kind of the, um, you know, the, the main focus. Um, in addition to that, you have this main plaza area, uh, which is kind of intended to be kind of the focal point of the TDA. And so that's why you have kind of a, a special you know, consideration for how does movement of pedestrians work between these two sites, not just from a north south perspective, uh, but also from a Huntington Club uh, and kind of this portion of the TVA site over. Uh, because as, as we were describing, I think David may have, I think it was David who had mentioned, you know, they're going to have retail, they're going to have non residential uses that could, could be used by people that are not exclusively at Huntington Club. So this connection helps to provide that type of um, permeability, I guess you could say. Um, between the sites. Um, Joanne, do you want to you want to jump in here? I could I could probably jibber jabber about this endlessly, but <laughs> um, happy to turn it over to you if you want to. You know, sure. Some, yeah. Um, yeah. If you indulge me for a couple of minutes, I uh, was giving this some thought today about how to summarize some of the things that we've discussed over the last several months. So. Um, and if you won't mind, I, I'd just like to share my screen and pull back in some earlier presentation. If that's okay. Sure, go ahead. So, um, you know, the question y'all can see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. So this is this is just showing the hunting club site, and I, I just turned it to try to rotate it to the um, to to show how it's going to connect um, to to the Wamata site. But um, you know, will the site? Will this development work without this connection? I mean, technically, yes. You know, like, can we still make a viable project that creates an urban form and provides a walkable experience? Yeah, we can. But will this connection make it significantly better? I, I believe that it will. Um, you know, as as um, 
Graham was saying, the hunting club's development plan is really set up and proffered in a way to make to allow for this connection to occur. And yes, today it's a 45 degree a foot difference between the two properties, but this road C, which is where the road, which is where this was considered, is being elevated by 20 feet. So the difference is going to be much less in the long run. And so when we started this process out and looking at these options, um, boy, this was last year now, we saw, you know, looking at the design of Hunting Club, we said, boy, it's a real opportunity to connect in road C into the uh, WMATA site and create a grid of streets, which is the same thing we've done on Richmond Highway, in Tysons, Reston, you know, all of the major urban areas of the county, we, we look to develop a grid of streets. Well, after evaluating it for umpteen different ways, I mean, with getting all the way up to engineering, you know, not to engineering, but up to that point, we realized that it's pretty infeasible to even mitigate that 20, 25 foot grade difference between the two properties using with a road over that small of a run. So then we said, well, in fact, what we're trying to do is create a pedestrian network throughout the site, because what we really want to do is create a permeable, walkable district that really makes these two distinct developments come together as one full neighborhood. And uh, we're going to do that by good, creating good, hopefully good streetscapes on North Kings and on Huntington um, by um, connecting the retail that's being proposed, as, as I think um, uh, Mr. Levine mentioned earlier on the Huntington Club site uh, in Land Bay B right here. Um, eventually, there be, would be retail on the WMATA site down here. Um, for North Kings, the opportunity is to connect to the the um, shopping center across the way with, with the retail on the site in the southern portion. So thinking about the retail and thinking about the pedestrian connections and then thinking about the public spaces really knit together a complete neighborhood, right? So in looking at it more holistically uh, between the two properties, what what do we where do we have opportunities to create that connection between the two? So as as Catherine mentioned and has been discussed, there's the going through the metro site. Well, that um, that only I think there are some things that lack about that connection that um, is cumbersome and doesn't really connect the neighborhoods. It connects the metro station. Uh, that that's what I would argue. And so. Um, this connection that that is shown here, yes, it looks convoluted right now because it is really just showing that there it is viable to create an ADA compliant um, pedestrian connection. It could be done a whole lot of ways. You could create just one beautiful grand stair of a of, with a grade difference of 20 feet and build an elevator in the corner of this building, and it could be very tight up against the building and really do no more damage to the. Um, to the tree canopy in this area, if if we if we really wanted to prioritize that, and and that elevator could could be covered and you know within that building to some degree that it it would not um, be just this public elevator that becomes a, a nuisance and a problem. But I think from the broader perspective, this trail does a number of things. It 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 serves more than one function. Yes, connectivity is key, but. Um, it really contributes to a vibrant public realm at the street level. It creates value in an inaccessible portion of the site by turning what would be a conservation easement into a visible, accessible public linear park, essentially. This, uh, it creates three sides to a potential building here uh, where amenities and things could be really spectacular. You could be um, either in the units above or really you know, at the main level here and have your gym, um, a daycare and be looking out onto this beautiful trail system and trees and then beyond to Eisenhower and and uh, Old Town and all of that. If this, if this is really could be the gem of the site. Um, so it really encourages sort of three sides of an architecture of this building to be to be of high quality um, and really becomes part of a building amenity. So the other piece is that you've got when we were looking at the overall package of development across the site, um, you have the main Huntington steps. I know it's kind of shaded out and I apologize for that, but this is the big central park for the Huntington club. I mean, the thing that really sold a lot of the community on this site. 
and it but it is sort of buried within within the development well so is so is the the wamata station plaza this the major public park and what's this what this pedestrian connection could do is really connect these two spaces together in a way that um knits together the whole upper half of of the neighborhood into one complete community so I think that there is a lot of value to doing this. I don't think it has to be in this particular configuration. We just wanted to make sure that it was feasible uh, at, at this point, but we haven't gotten to that engineering level, obviously. Uh, I think there's a number of ways that this could be achieved uh, using a lesser footprint if that's what's desirable, but um, that would be my case to make. I'm sorry. Or, I would mention one more. Oh, go ahead, Mary. Sorry, I didn't, Electro didn't see footprint. What was the word you used? A lighter, just a lighter footprint. I, we could keep it tighter, yeah, oh. to the to the building. You can see here, for example, um, this this version of it creates sort of a main path that's very direct between the two using using stairs, and then there's sort of two sets, two ramps that. Um, create the, the ADA accessible portion of it. Even with, and if you recall from the March discussion, Dover Cole looked at um, a, a various number of scenarios of how to get around these two developments and around the whole TSA. And in every instance, even with the ramps, which again, we, we wouldn't necessarily have to do, but we could find other mechanisms, but creates a shorter path, a significantly shorter path between these two projects. And I think there's other opportunities for engaging with the conservation easement. You know, if we're going to be looking at the other area along the Huntington community and the backside of Biscayne as a conservation easement, um, this might be an opportunity to be a place where we can truly engage with nature. And maybe there's points at which these um, trail pieces connect into the natural environment, like you can see these um, very, I mean, these are these are pretty wild. This is a botanical gardens and and shows these elevated paths. I mean, this is this is very significant grades. Um, but you get an idea of a flavor of sort of being nestled within the natural landscape um, rather than you know this um, heavy, intense infrastructure. So I guess I'll just end with um, one of the, when when Dover Cole was looking at the network overall. Um, this is this is what's currently being proposed is as I think the general street network, and I think you can see uh, just by looking at this that there's pretty significant gaps, you know, in just creating a general network of connections. And this one is even more difficult, you know, in part because the garage is there, but. The, the multiple levels of differences. And I, you know, going back to the idea of an a shuttle system, a circulator, or even an autonomous um, minibus to, to create a, um, a additional connections that probably obviously are the most accessible for people that in, um, you know, with differing needs, um, that, might, that might serve the Huntington Avenue side and bring people directly up to the metro station and the plazas and all of the development. Um, and and I think, but but there's still this gap and this need um, to make to make this connection. It seems so obvious. So when you see this with the blue, you can see how you know this this builds in an actual network of of pedestrian space um, connections. So would that actually serve as a connection between south and north? Yeah. Okay. Another thing, and I think this image really helps with this, um, is explaining this in the context of the overall network uh, for the, the TDA. As you see, we're, we're Joanne zoomed in here at the courts at Huntington, as well as at Aventon, actually, and I'll, and I'll pull it up on the, the other pedestrian circulation slide. There were connections that were proffered um, as a part of the, um, the 2000 rezoning that did those developments, the original entitlement for land, uh, land unit F that showed pedestrian connections to Biscayne and to Blaine Avenue. So the staircases that are located there and the trails uh, that are located there, those are those are improvements that were um, recommended as a part of the comprehensive plan and were proffered as a part of that. 
that portion of the Lamada station uh, redevelopment at the time. So we're carrying kind of the, the 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 spirit of that in terms of how to connect this site together better. Uh, in a, in a thank you, Joanne. Um, in a manner that's been done, you know, that was done 22 years ago. <laughs> um, so this is we think of this as kind of phase phase two in terms of how to how the whole thing better together. And yeah, and the difference here is it looks more convoluted because we're trying to show that, and and it's actually less of a grade difference. Um, but we're trying to show that it can be ADA accessible, and so it just looks wonkier. It's not this a uh, clean, direct, more direct connection. Although this one, this lower connection is more of a weaving trail through the woods. Um, it's a little bit more recreational based because it's getting to the park. But this one is just, you know, just a straight up shot of stairs. It's actually more of a grade change um, on this game than, than what we'd be dealing with once the, the Huntington Club site is uh, redeveloped and that, that grade changes. I think in a perfect world, we would take the shuttle system and and just expand it to the whole the whole TSA and create create good connectivity north and south, as well as you know down Huntington Avenue, the Arden. There's so many developments that are that are coming and and neighborhoods that exist there that I think you know could could find real value in having shuttle a circulator system to the metro station. But I don't think that just replaces good connectivity across the site. Um, Mary, your hand is still up. Did you have a? No, I, I think, yeah, I, I think this is kind of complicated enough that we need to discuss it in a a, a wider group and, and have a more of a, yeah, some of this kind of presentation. Um, you know, we've been talking about this since the beginning and now it's coming up in pictures at the second to the last meeting and I feel kind of, um, you know, I could like to spend a little more time with this and hear a little more opinions from different people. So we, we'd be happy to, Mary. We we did go over these slides at a previous uh, presentation. I'm not sure if you were there or not, but I'd be happy to send you the link to the to the video where um, and this and the slide deck, for example. Um, OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Viani. Yeah. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Joanne, for your, your points. And, and to be clear, you know, when this idea was first came up, I thought it was actually a really cool idea. We were looking at it kind of mimicking some of what was done in the Abington project, which is this promenade that kind of goes around, kind of sweeps around the front of there. And, you know, it's a really good thing that it's at grade, you know, and then, you know, it stares down to, you know, where the future bus station will be. Yeah, the challenge we had is when we start really looking at this. I mean, let's, let's look at this property. This is a, this the the land bay E is a property that go, that depending on where you measure it, drops 134 feet, yeah, you know, from south to north, or 149 feet from south to north, yeah, you know, depending on where you measure it. You know, let's assume you know it's the lesser measurement, you know, over in Huntington Club. You know, when we look at where the connection points that we think of the natural connection points. Once, as I said, you know, on Huntington, that's the natural point where people will walk on Huntington Drive. Two, where you've got that point where the kiss and ride is, and that's great. And if you look at where that connects, that serves, that's going to serve the folks in Huntington Club. It's going to serve the people in the buildings there. You get past those buildings and over those townhouses, serves all of those folks. And then you go up this, we call it Rocky Run Trail, I think you call it. And the, we've already kind of heard, you know, the Rocky Run Trail is not going to be ADA accessible. You know, because it, why? Because it's going up a very steep, we just lost the thing. Um, can we, yeah, can we? Go back to where we were. Sure. Sorry. But you know, the Rocky Run Trail, you know, at the end of the day, it's not going to be, it's not a viable ADA accessible, you know, kind of north to south connection point. It's going up, you know, pretty significant incline. And so then we've got this question of okay, we've got this incline, the, the midpoint connection here. And the challenge we have is what's cost effective, what's safe, what's secure, what where does it connect into through this environmental environmentally sensitive area? And why are we putting it here? You know, and you look, you say, OK, well, if I go further up Rocky Run Trail, you know, you've got the ability to connect in right on North Kings Highway. You've got the ability to connect in right in front of this building. You know, you've got that building itself pushed back somewhat because we've got the park there. You know, and I guess when I was kind of envisioning this, we were thinking something like with the Abington project with that sweeping at grade. But, you know, where you have the top of that bus shelter or the bus, the bus the bus plaza on top of it mm -hmm. having it like that maybe something that kind of swung around the outside of the front of that building you know and connects it and kind of mid block 
up where uh, the top building is for Huntington Club. And if I could control this, I, you could see my cursor, but you can't. Um, but let, let's take a look at S3, the building S3. If the building S3 was pushed back a little bit, and you've got, you know, you see you've got where that plaza is right now where the, the top on top of the bus BRT station. And then you've got that kind of little kind of peachy kind of little plaza area there. And if that were to sweep around the front of S3 and connect in mid block where this last kind of uh, weird trapezoidal t uh, structure, the southernmost portion of, of phase three of Huntington Club, you know, you've got a much less grade challenged situation there. But the problem with where we're locating it here is it requires all these switchbacks to be ADA accessible. And then once you get to Huntington Club, it's neither accessible north or south. You have to then go into Huntington Club and then go ahead and you know, somehow find another ADA accessible place to get there. So, you know, so maybe. Wait, wait a minute, Mark. Yeah. I'm not following because when it comes to when it hits Huntington Club, it would be at the road level, which right. is, there's no more steps here. This is right. all talking, at grade. Exactly. But I'm talking about like if you take there and you you, you you step off and you either turn due right or due left down the, the Rocky Run Trail. Mm -hmm. That is not ADA accessible. This portion is here because there's no stairs here. The stairs are all up here. OK, so that's going to be given that 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 grade. They're going to be able to make that ADA accessible. Yeah, th there, this part there, of the, of the walkway. There? Yeah. OK, so we get ourselves up there and then where do we go? You know, how do you connect from where we are right here into, you know, where S3 is? Well, the problem is we've got to do this series of switchbacks if we want it to be ADA accessible. And you're going right in the middle of the environmental area. You know, I'm saying, you know, and who who is that really connecting? Who is that serving? It's serving basically the people who are in that building right there, that phase three building, and the, the other phase three building, the northern half of that phase three building. Them, maybe a couple of the townhouses as you get further, you know, up to the arc. You're not getting a whole hell, whole heck of a lot of users there. And I mean, just but look at across the site. You've got uh -huh. building all these large buildings that how else do they get around the site if not they have to go up and all the way around in addition you've got people coming you know as we were just talking about with the retail people coming to the site mm -hmm. and without a connection across here we're you're going to come here then you're, you're gonna you're gonna have to get in, in your car again to drive over to here to building the you know it's it's so wonky without you're creating not, a connection through the yeah. site but you're really not. You're going to have the ability say, and again, I wish I had a, the ability to show a cursor here. You know, say you're at that top pavilion. You would walk from that top pavilion right here around the the, the boundary of uh, S3, between S3 and, and North Kings Highway, and you would connect in with Little Rocky Run. And you connect there and you go down that pathway there, or you connect on to North Kings Highway, you go down that way, and you go into the community. Those are two point connection points there. On the southern side, you have the port where, you know, it connects in with the Kiss and Ride, and you have the connection with a, with a Huntington Drive. You know, you're not getting much. This doesn't really do much. It, it's nice and it's scenic, and I like it. It is attractive. But when you start thinking about it from a practical standpoint, either you're using an elevator, which is going to be immensely expected, expensive, particularly if it's an, out, an indoor, outdoor elevator, you know, and you're taking down trees and you're doing all kinds of things that are going to, you know, further degrade that environmental feature there, you know, I'm saying perhaps maybe if there's a way to kind of wrap it around either the outside of the S3 building and connecting it right where that little plaza is at the southern tip. Of, like like uh, in here? Uh, exactly, right there, or just around the immediate periphery. You know, you know, uh, look at S3, and you say you were going to go on the north side of S3. All right. On the north side of S3, you have that plaza, and you're kind of following the periphery. And again, I wish I had it. Yeah. Keep going south there, and then you go around the periphery there, and you're going there, and you're connecting in mid-block there. I don't know what the grade difference is there, but perhaps there's a way to do something there. But when you look at this switchback, you think about, you know, you know, if I was looking at it from ADA standpoint, and I'm doing an inclement weather, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the metro station. I'm going to get waved through. I'm going to take the funicular, or I'm going to take the stairs, I mean the, or, the, or the escalator, and go down there and then connect in down that way it, it, or i'm going to do the reverse you know that's the only true you know ada accessible indoor weather preserve weather weatherproof connection north to south you know this I mean, is no, a really no nice sidewalks idea. are really weather i think 
Yeah, I mean, no sidewalks are weatherproof in general, right. but I, I think the op that's one of the reasons why we showed a very generic sort of connection between North and South in that area, because just like you're saying, I think there are a whole host of ways to achieve that connection. Uh, so we weren't presuming a specific location of where that had to occur or how it had to occur, just that some sort of connection between the two developments um, that's not North Kings and not through the metro station would be would be pursued. Um, so I think you're right. There are not a whole host of ways that you could you could scab onto the building with, on as a podium um, and and sort of wrap it around the building. I mean, you could create a grand staircase um, and find another accessible entrance. You know, like we were saying, elevators or escalators that are part of the building. Um, so. I, it's just why, it's the idea that the connection right is, is there. Needed. I mean, I just think, I think you get, I think you get that when we look at this plan here, and unfortunately, there's a plaza still on top of it. You have a the dashed line down North Kings Highway, and then you have that little plaza symbol, and then you have the plaza symbol kind of covering up another series. And Graham, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, exactly. You have another series of little dots right there, you know, and that's what I'm saying. That should be sufficient. This thing cutting through the heart of the conservation area, because don't forget, we're now going to have to, we're taking this thing down and to make it ADA accessible and we'll be doing a series of switchbacks, you know, and we're taking out more and more stuff. And then the whole thing's kind of an, an elevated format. So it's going to be like a bridge, the first thing to freeze, the first thing to be exposed to the elements and you know, more adverse. And all those trees I take down, I've then got to somehow replant in a way that's accessible from urban forestry elsewhere on the site, you know, and that it, it just, when I look at that, it's a great idea at first when I started thinking about what it actually looks like from practical limitation. That's a lot of effort for not a lot of result when there's a more cost effective solution immediately, what, 30, 40 feet to the to the south on that thing, if you kind of rotate it there. And, you know, and what's the environmental cost? What's the, you know, how much is it really going to serve people? I don't know. But then the question is also, you know, how do you, Repair that, maintain it, improve it, secure it, illuminate it at night, maybe, you know, patrol it. It's not it's not like Abington, where Abington's at grade right in the front of the building, you know, but maybe something like that could be part of an S3 building or something like that, you know, a small thing. So pull, pull, the S3 pull the S3 building closer to, to uh, pull the S3 building closer to the North Kings Highway and provide the space for it. You know? So I don't want to, this is a good conversation. I want to make sure that we are rec recognizing the time. It's, it, oh, no, no, it's not. It's not you, Mark. <laughs> We're having, a, having a great, great discussion, but it is 846. Um, I know some people will probably need to drop off. And if, if you do need to just feel free, just let me know. Um, uh, but this has been a, a very good discussion. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to pause my my comments on this in particular because there are other, other folks that are on the that want to that want to speak to this. So Catherine, I think you're up next. Yeah, I just have a couple quick questions. Um, who's responsible for building this? As you now have it, number one, who's responsible for maintaining it? Number two, who's responsible for shutting it off? So silly people who don't pay attention to the fact that it's icy or wet or whatever. So who's responsible? And then who's going to get sued when somebody slips and hurts themselves? So in the language that we have, we've noted private uh, private ownership of these types of trails and, and walkways. So for, I, I see it as the developer of the S3 block in particular would probably be the most likely uh, the mo most likely builder of this and maintainer of this this section uh, with, with public access over it. So they're the ones who are going to get sued. So you seriously think somebody's going to go build this? I mean, I don't mean to be rude, but, you know, I testified quite a long time ago about the comp plan years ago, and I got a chuckle from the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. Lovely document, but what you're going to end up with is just a PhD dissertation, and that's a shame. So please listen to what Mark is saying, and Joanne, that's not a hit on you. It's just that this is not workable. You got to come up with a better solution to accommodate the people who are going to live here. Okay, Mary, I think you're next. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to debate this exact walkway because I, I still don't know enough about it. I've seen some very compact switchback walkways, for example, on Alexandria schools that are on a, a sharp grade. And I'm, I'm sure you can find some examples of these that have been done right and haven't engendered a lot of lawsuits. So what I, what I just wanted to say, though, is Mark's uh, comments on you know, how easy it is to go through the metro and to um, go upstairs and take elevators and whatnot. As someone who's experienced issues with that for decades, I, and I lived in the Huntington duplexes for many years, nobody went through the metro in that neighborhood to get to the top. It was, it was considered outrageous that you had to pay for a trip to get from one side of the metro to the other. Um, maybe that's changed, but that was not in the in the uh, not what anybody in the neighborhood considered something with, worth doing. Um, the um, elevators in the metro. I had to quit using the metro at one point because the elevators never worked, and I, I couldn't do this. Do the and the elevators and the escalators never work. So metro doesn't have a very good good uh, track record for ada people it, i had to abandon it because it just failed all the time so it would be good to see something that was stable and and stationary and had switchbacks that weren't too steep and that uh, enabled people to get through the neighborhood i don't know what the exact solution is i like the view from this part this walkway but you know i'm also environmentalist so i don't want to cut down too many trees and destroy that piece of land but I think we would need a lot more discussion to come up with something that uh, that works. I think it's important that we keep trying. And from Metro's perspective, I'd add all connections are good connections from our point of view. Uh, that Again, that's the, a key to ridership. Um, I think one of the uh, tones that you may be hearing is, um, a concern about cost and getting a project that's um, feasible, that can be delivered, um, that we can have clarity on, on maintenance and liability responsibilities. Um, and so we're, we're just wanting to make sure this plan strikes that balance so it isn't a, a thesis document and, and one that actually leads to community improvement. Uh, Mr. Sergeant. Uh, thanks. I, I think this uh, just a suggestion now, given that it is almost nine o'clock, that we should probably dedicate like maybe a 20 or 30 minute segment of the July 11th meeting for a resolution of this. And that gives everybody time to do some more research and discussion, provide individual input to staff um, and see what they come up with. I, I, I realize this is a difficult uh, challenge, um, but don't think we're going to resolve it tonight. My two cents. I think that's a good idea. Sure. Mary, did you have something else? Uh, I agree with that, Tim. No, that's good. We should talk about it more next time. Okay. Um, again, I, I, we're, new, we're about 22 minutes over time, so if if it, others are able to stay around, I'll I'll get through the rest of the slides, but I'll be brief. Um, I think this is probably the the most key uh, kind of element of this, and and probably the, the most critical kind of discussion point uh, from staff standpoint. So I really appreciate the discussion. I think we've um, we've, we've gotten a lot of good um, got a, a lot of good ideas um, on the on the table. So uh, not the end of the discussion by any stretch of the imagination, but um, thank you. So this has been great. All right, so we talked about parks and open space. Uh, no changes to building forms and activating street frontages. Uh, this is the, the area of Mary that we, where we had talked about um, the ground floor uses and the, the types of retail uh, and commercial uses that were envisioned, so no changes there. Uh, we did talk about the, the building heights. Um, we had this question about 55 or 85 or 55 or something else. And so I think we'll be able to come back uh, with some revisions to the maps uh, that reflect the, the, the discussion. Uh, multimodal circulation, kind of a couple of things. Um, one, we have a recommendation here uh, that we've added about connectivity across the site, specifically across North Kings Highway and across Huntington Avenue. 
uh, noting that there should be clearly marked uh, crosswalks provided at all four legs of signalized intersections. Um, so this is consistent with the active uh, transportation uh, effort that's underway uh, currently where uh, that Tim um, uh, Tim Cuts, one of our DOT uh, planners had presented on, I believe earlier this spring, uh, that had recommended um, some, some specific improvements to a couple of interchanges near the site, uh, as well as a mid-block crossing um, that should be provided uh, between Metroview Parkway and Fenwick Drive uh, to facilitate direct access to the Canyon Road Greenway Trail uh, from the site. So um, those are those are two you know, two additions to this. Trails versus walkways is another change, but it's just uh, make it to make it consistent with the terminology we use in the, uh, in the maps. Any questions on this one? Yeah. Uh, last one, I wish Lynn were here, <laughs> uh, but we have added uh, one sentence here regarding a circulator system uh, providing a convenient public connection between the nor northern and southern portions of the site and a broader TSA uh, that such a circulator system should be explored. Uh, so this is trying to uh, get at what uh, Commissioner Sargent as well as Lynn were, were describing, which is you know kind of that real need for north-south connectivity, and so just providing another option for how that might be addressed. All right, vehicle parking. So one thing that we had discussed with Lamada in particular was you know the application of this parking section to uh, new new development on the site versus. Uh, WMATA facilities, and so this language here clarifies that, you know, that this is intended for the new development um, as opposed to uh, to metro site metro metro garages proper. Um, so noting that they're they should be provided below grade. Um, if they are provided above grade, they should be wrapped with buildings, uh, active uses, that sort of thing. Um, but otherwise remains the same. Uh, similar comment regarding EV chargers. Um, so this this would apply to the uh, to the new development in particular, we've taken out a 2% recommendation. So we had previously said 2% of uh, spaces should be provided as EV. And we've removed that, uh, that that reference to 2%. Uh, I think that the, the policy plan speaks to EV chargers, generally speaking. In a lot of instances across the county, uh, there's, a, there's a, a push for far more than 2%. So we didn't see much utility in actually saying 2% uh, as some sort of floor uh, when the, when the the market seems to be moving more towards EV, uh, you know, a greater percentage of EV in a lot of situations. So um, we have it more general here, but it's not intended to um, be less than the, the 2%. It's, it's actually um, supposed to be able to open up a, a broader discussion about it. Any questions on parking? Mr. Sergeant. Just one one question for um, for Metro in terms of EV uh, charging facilities. I, I don't want to add to the cost of building the garage and everything, but are there opportunity? Do you see opportunities within the garage, um, within the parking facilities for EV stations? Um, so we, you know, between Metro and the, the commute to and from their homes, you, you may really reduce the amount of, uh, um, the, you know, fossil fuels from vehicles that you use. <laughs> yeah, we are. Uh, we have recently passed this. Uh, one second, buddy. We have <laughs> recently passed a sustainability policy um, that is increasing our commitment um, to green growth. And as part of that, we're evaluating the business case for EV charging and, and looking at the cost to. One second, I'll get your passy. <laughs> the cost to outfit. Stay, uh, our existing parking facilities with the infrastructure to support EV versus um, the income that we would receive. Um, these types of operations, Metro's policy requires our the positive fiscal impacts. Um, otherwise, be subsidized by the jurisdictions um, because of our multi state agreement. Um, so definitely looking at it, we just don't have any affirmative uh, clarity on that business case yet. Uh, you you have a very active consultant working with you tonight. I I, I do, <laughs> <laughs> and it's the witching hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that helps. I appreciate the comments on that. Thank you. All 
All right, last uh, last two slides, I promise. Um, this slide consolidates two sections that we had previously. One was regarding green building, the other is regarding environment, stormwater, landscape buffers. Um, so there are these are editorial changes to try to condense uh, the terminology, uh, but retains the overall policy direction. Lead silver um, and uh, innovative stormwater practices. Um, we have re we've taken out a clause at the very end, you know, that's relatively vague regarding, you know, what 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 do you do if you if you're not able to meet the lead uh, lead uh, stormwater credits? Uh, it's just it's setting the expectation that this would be a uh, meeting lead silver. Um, or uh, the an equivalent third party program. So there's flexibility there. If it's not lead, um, there are other um, other third water, third party uh, entities that 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 we use in the county um, as a, as an acceptable um, as an acceptable standard. So Earthcraft others um, can, can fill that fill that need. Uh, and then lastly, there is a clause here regarding tree preservation. So um, noting that development in this easement area, so the S3 block, which we've discussed you know, at length, as well as the conservation easement uh, that's on the site on the western portion, um, that we would be looking to have, uh, if if those areas are developed, um, that those areas that are that are where the trees are taken out um, should be offset to the degree feasible um, by restoration, planting new trees elsewhere on the site, including in that area that's adjacent to uh, the Huntington neighborhood that we've discussed it, uh, previously. Uh, with the goal of meeting uh, tree preservation targets, so that's intended to link it back to the, the PFM standards uh, that we have uh, for, um, for for development when it's going through the uh, the site plan process. And any questions there? I see Tim, and then Mark. Nope, not me. Okay, Mark. I would just say uh, you, you, you've got the WMATA comments. Take a look at that. I think we we basically agree with everything you guys are saying, the goals and stuff. We've just got some kind of, again, the kind of tomato, tomato in terms of keeping it more general in terms of standards, uh, but not worth getting into right now. Okay, understood. I would just say that the lead language is almost verbatim from Huntington Club, um, so I'll just put right. that out there. Yeah. And our, our basic, our point is, you know, I don't, I don't, if we knew we were going forward immediately, that wouldn't be a problem. It's just this is maybe a 20, 30 year build out and we're just saying basically whoever, whatever the customary standard is at that point, maybe lead may get replaced by something else and tying to a standard. But, you know, that's not worth a big discussion right now. All right, I know we're rushing through this, so folks, if you do have comments, take a look at the document. I know we're, we're hitting on these these points very quickly right now, so um, I recognize this is a very cursory overview. Um, We've re we've taken out the green building uh, section we, and it's been synthesized with the previous. Uh, and then last last thing is uh, that language about Aventon, so it's been relocated to Lynn. That's it. <laughs> so those are all the changes. Um, I will stop there. Um, if there are any particular comments uh, regarding kind of the, the overall direction, um, we could talk about them now. But I recognize it's also nine o'clock, so I'm sure most yep. of y'all want um, to get to other things. So. Hey. Any comments, or Mark? Just real quick. Uh, first of all, thank you, staff, and thank you everybody who has been participating and listening to really good conversations like that. Uh, you've got, yes, you know, Graham. You got our comments. The only one thing for affordable housing was we got in there a proposed language that you know kept your language there, and we added thing as an alternative. You know, the affordable housing requirements for the for land bay E could be met with a a single development providing 180 units of affordable units. Which may end up giving the way the ADU ordinances or is done may provide more affordable housing units than we could otherwise achieve under ADU. But the goal basically being to create that option in case we do get an Amazon type funding option to come in there and you know that would truff give us equivalently 12% less than 15%, but maybe more than you could achieve, you know, actual ADU. Units. So we actually just take a look at that and recognize that's why that's in there. Thank you. And Mary, you have your hand raised. Yeah, did I did I understand you said you got that language in? We submit we submitted some language to the staff this afternoon. So oh, okay. well, that we can ask staff to distribute that around. Okay, yeah. I'd like to see that. I'll distribute yeah. yeah, some goal, language as well. Yeah, the I goal have, is to just basically provide an option in case we have a unique funding source that's going to look in here and could maybe give us a, a big slug of affordable housing units that we might not other be able to achieve. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I may argue with you that the best way to get extra funding is to lower our standards. So 
we may have to have more of a discussion about that. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to argue. Right. I just so we we would take that another day and we keep working at it. Um, seeing no other hands raised and there are no other comments. Thank you to Graham for your presentation tonight and Jane, Phoebe, Bob Corm, and Ramada and the rest of the staff and very engaging and important conversation tonight. So thank you to everyone. And July 11th is our next meeting. So look out for that invitation that will be coming out for our, our Zoom meeting. And uh, there's nothing else for the good of the group. Um, uh, say good night to you all. And enjoy Walter, the rest of the week. Walter, yeah. this is Holly Doherty. Can I just ask a quick question? So I, I just wanted some clarification, Mark, if I could, for Mark Viani. Because mm -hmm. Mark wears lots of different hats. And so I just wanted to be clear on the comments that he's providing tonight are on behalf of Wamata mm -hmm. as yes. as counsel for Wamata. Okay. Yes. All right. I just wanted to be clear so I could understand that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for that point of clarification, Holly. And um, if there is no other comments, I look forward to seeing you all the next time. All right. Thank you all for your time. Thank really you again. Great discussion. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.